मशीन लर्निंग इमेज प्रोसेसिंग आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस एंड क्लाउड कंप्यूटिंग आर इजिली दी फोर डोमेन्स दैट हैव चेंज ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट सेंचुरी द मोस्ट नो वंडर देर आर सो मेनी पीपल वॉन्टिंग टू मेक करियर इन दिस डोमेन बिकॉज ऑफ द लुक्रेटिव अपॉर्चुनिटीज दीज डोमेन्स प्रोवाइड यू विथ हैविंग सेट दैट गाइज लेट एस क्विकली टेक अ लुक एट द एजेंडा ऑफ दिस सेशन वेन यू टॉक अबाउट दी ऑफरिंग्स दिस सेशन वुड स्टार्ट ऑफ बाई अंडरस्टैंडिंग और डिस्कसिंग वॉट मशीन लर्निंग इज एंड हाउ टू यूज इट विथ ए डब्ल्यू एस वी वुड अंडरस्टैंड वाई डू वी नीड टू यूज आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस विथ ए डब्ल्यू एस एंड हाउ इट हेल्प्स ऑन द लॉन्गर रन वी डिस्कस सम ऑफ द एम एल स्टैक ऑफ प्रोडक्ट्स दैट ए डब्ल्यू एस हेज टू ऑफर टू अस वी वुड टॉक अबाउट अमेजॉन सेज मेकर विच इज एन इम्पॉर्टेंट मशीन लर्निंग सर्विस देन वुड गोड एंड अंडरस्टैंड अमेजॉन रिकोगशन वुड अंडरस्टैंड हाउ इमेज प्रोसेसिंग एंड इमेज एंड ऑब्जेक्ट डिटेक्शन वर्कस Going ahead, we will discuss some of the important machine learning and AI services like Amazon Polly, TextTrack, and a lot more. So I believe this agenda is clear to you guys. Let us get started. So welcome, machine learning on cloud. That's exactly what the core focus on this session would be. Core focus. Um, for today and what exactly is our agenda going to be that's exactly what we'll start with um the mission with which cloud providers come in today's era is democratizing machine learning i mean that's exactly the core trillion dollar business that every single cloud provider is seeing so what exactly are they trying to do they are bringing in a machine learning concept that can be used by every single developer every single business analyst programmer so you don't need to be a data scientist with extensive experience or exposure in in kind of model building and things like that but with simple click and knitting up multiple services and features you are you will be able to um make your uh, solutions in terms of data science right so that's exactly what you're going to see in this next two hours so agenda for today ml at amazon.com so that's that's what we are going to see to start with the remaining part okay so why ai on aws i mean that's not going to be the core focus area over here but but we'll just touch upon what what's the basic reason for um ai on aws uh, aws ml stack we are going to talk about a different stack altogether which is available in amazon right so when you speak about machine learning services what are those stacks right so that's what we're going to see and different ai services is not going to be the focus area for uh, today's uh, session that's why i just striked it out in future we're going to see some of those right and amazon sage maker to end our session that's how exactly we're going to focus on first you're going to see a theoretical concept or or the understanding of how exactly a sage maker is going to work that's what we're going to start with and then we'll have a quick hands on of how to build a model um not really model how exactly you can do your processing of data science using a tool or a service that's available or given to you from aws which is nothing but amazon sage maker so that's the holistic view of it uh prerequisite or, or my expectation is um understanding over here is you guys are not someone who is over here to learn data science or, or trying to learn model building or trying to learn a cloud environment my assumption over here is you guys already have a bit of information or quite a bit of information about how to traverse through cloud environment you know how to get into multiple machine systems and different aws services that's that's one next one you already would be someone who is creating your data science modeling in terms of traditional environment or maybe you will be spinning up an anac i mean sorry not spinning up you will be kick starting in an anaconda and then a jupiter notebook or any other zeppelin or any notebook you are going to create your own model building on your on premises or on your laptop and then try executing it so that's the kind of environment that you're coming up with and now you want to port this exact kind of an exposure into cloud environment how exactly you can do that so so hope expectation is pretty clear i uh, top cloud provider uh, that exists today and who are trying to get a piece of machine learning in cloud environment these are the top 3 providers right now amazon web services microsoft azure and google cloud right so you can see it's slightly older one so i i kind of saw that the latest um i believe uh july 2019 report from uh gartner is already out which says as an infrastructure as model aws still stand for the past 9 years continuously at the topmost uh, quadrant 
So this is nothing but the leader's quadrant. And you can see x-axis is nothing but the completeness of vision. And the y-axis is ability to execute. So how much bulk is their pocket? So do, you, do they have enough infrastructure or resources available to do that execution part? So that's where always the leaders got run stand for the past nine months, uh, sorry, nine years, AWS has been topping this table. Uh, a simple example now to start with uh, a use case scenario. I just want to get you guys in sync with what was happening in, in, in uh, data science world. I'm pretty much sure all of you guys know this black box, which is Amazon Alexa, right? And this innovation from Redbus was almost two years back. So I, I'm not sure about what was the project because I have attended one of the seminars from Red, uh, Redbus. So that's where the innovation came from. So what exactly they're trying to do is Redbus wanted, I'm assuming everyone know what exactly is a Redbus um, app doing, right? So it's like, I want to book a, a travel from in a bus from Bangalore to Mumbai. I'm just going to take this app and going to say which destination from Bangalore to Mumbai I need to travel and what date I need to travel and provide all those information. Multiple buses are going to be listed for me and I need to choose one uh, using the app and I get my book ticket books. I mean, tickets booked, right? So that's how exactly the process runs. So what Redbus have done is they've made all this in tandem with the Amazon Alexa kit. So basically what you need to do is you as a customer, you're going to say, Alexa, book me a ticket for uh, Bangalore to Mumbai. So immediately Alexa is going to um, give, a, give a voice instructions back, which is going to say, when exactly you want to book this ticket, right? So you're going to say, uh, book the ticket um, on 15th of August, 2019. And you're going to use a different language over here now. I just put Hindi over here. So on this budget, right? Now the beauty of this tool is the, 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 the kind of innovation what they've done is it can currently support nine different vernacular languages, nine different languages from India, right? So it's like Malayalam, English, Hindi, Tamil, Canada, and multiple other uh, formal languages it can currently support, right? And it's going to immediately at the end of the transaction, it's going to say, I have booked your ticket on this particular day this particular uh, bus has been booked. Uh, please see your phone and you can see that particular book, uh, book ticket available on your phone. But the beauty of it is not building this tool. A number of guys, innovative guys have already been in the task of doing such kind of innovation. But the beauty of it is every single thing from a concept to production, it just took them uh, or what how much time it took for them to create it, it's just four hours, right? That's what we call it as democratization. In traditional world, it would have taken you almost um, one month FT, 30 days, four or five people working on it. And that's how your products has been built into the production. This is from a concept to a production, it took them four hours to build this tool, right? So that's what you really call it as democratizing the environment. Okay, so that's where I want to just sync you guys. What are we going to see in the next couple of hours and things like that? Just giving my quick introduction. So I'm Shaji Pulukul. Um, I, this is close to my 20th or 19 plus years of software solution experience. I, the technology friend, I started my career with mainframe, VMS, kind of an, an traditional or a legacy environment. Um, close to six years now, I'm doing my innovation or my research on big data um, and analytics. I mean, that's a core area which I focus on and AI ML as well. So I was there with working with Amazon for um, close to three and a half years. Um, I moved out of Amazon a um, couple of weeks back and I'm now um, associated with great learnings and, and my own uh, consultancy as well, right? So that's, that's where I stand. Um, the kind of certification I process, um, I've done my AWS uh, solution architect, system operations, big data and machine learning certification. So that's that's what I possess. That's about me. Okay, now machine learning at amazon.com, the retail giant amazon.com, where do they use their machine learning capability, right? So some of their capabilities in machine learnings has been typically used by um, even AWS environment. Right, so that's what we want to know. First and foremost, you buy some books, immediately you can see a recommendation coming. In case we have bought a book on deep learning, you can see another one, Python deep learning kind of suggestions given to you, right? Personalizing whatever you have bought, you as a customer, that's the first place they are using 
uh, machine learning uh, in Amazon.com. The next one, inventory management. I, I think it's known as Kiva Robot, I believe. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how many of you are, uh, know about it. It's pretty famous, right? Kiva Robot is nothing but uh, when you and me order a, a huge amount of inventories or, or products from Amazon, it's not like um, a single guy, an inventory person is going to, not going to go to the store and pick up these particular products and come back to you. Instead, that's been done by these Kiva robots, right? You can just search for Kiva robots, Amazon. You should be able to see some of those YouTube videos available, right? So that's another innovation. Intelligently, it's going to pick it up, do some of those um, infrastructure ways, um, activities are being done by this um, robot. Drones, uh, pretty much everyone know, uh, it's pretty popular now. Uh, Amazon with, with their vision in place, 30 minutes delivery. That's exactly what the innovation they want to bring in. Uh, that's where the drone comes in, Amazon Prime Air, Alexa, everyone pretty much know about it. Now a voice instruction that's going to give you and behind the scene, it's Amazon Lex or AWS Lex, in fact, powered, powering it, right? So which is available for you as a service. Now you can also use those exact same technology that has been used by Amazon. You also can use from an AWS environment to create some of those innovative um, um, items. Uh, the next one is Amazon Go. Um, it's, it's like you can just walk in scanning your phone to this entry and then you can just walk in, do your shopping and come back, no queue uh, whatsoever. Whatever is being picked up from that particular queue is being tagged directly to your app and you can just walk off, right? So the, the credit billing and everything will be um, done through your app. So that's exactly some of the Amazon's machine learning innovations that you can see in the existing world. One key thing is exact same similar technologies is being those technologies that's powering amazon.com, it's there even you're in your hands now through AWS, right? You can take it up, some of the services, knit it together and utilize exactly the same thing, right? So that's the beauty of it. And that's the whole and soul uh, session that we're gonna see in the next couple of hours. Okay, so now why AWS for AI? First and foremost reason, there are more than 10,000 different customers who is actually using AI services on AWS. Another, some of the statistics or uh, information that you need to know is TensorFlow as a framework that are close to, I'm assuming some, uh, most of you know TensorFlow, I mean, TensorFlow, MXNet, um, PyTorch, and all those, all those Keras, all those libraries available for machine learning, right? So close to 85% of the TensorFlow libraries are currently working on um, AWS environment, right? That's, that's something. So that's, that could be some of the reasons for you to pick AWS. Right, the infrastructure topping for the past nine years. Okay, so wide variety of AI and ML services for your business, right? So you can see n number of services. If you are going to grow smaller machines, smaller AI based machines are available. If you're going to have a bigger machines, bigger thing available for you, or in case multiple services for your data churning, for your data crunching, what are the kind of services required? You ask for it and Amazon is there or AWS is there to readily giving it for you. Right, no upfront cost, low cost and ease to use. Click of a button, you're gonna use those services. That's exactly the next component. Um, support for all the popular framework, that's exactly what I spoke about. You have support for MXNet, uh, Keras, um, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and also many of those built-in um, frameworks or algorithms are available on, as a product on SageMaker, which we are gonna see in a short while. And wide variety of HPC machines. So that means uh, if your requirement is churning a, a small amount of data, you can use ML um, dot T2 instance. Next assumptions, as I told at the, at the upfront of the session, I'm assuming you guys know what exactly T2 medium, M4 M or M5 medium and all those machine types, right? So starting from T2 medium, you can have even a 64 core kind of a machines as well. So from one core machines to 64 core machines, you can have a GPU based CUDA architecture available. Everything is available in AWS environment, right? So that's exactly what we say, wide variety of HPC machines, right? It's gonna have a parallel time check as well, okay. Okay, now this is where our core things gonna start now. Starting from, we're going to do a bottom up uh, sequence uh, moment. ML framework and infrastructure. Now, what exactly that means is 
I have wide variety of infrastructure component available for running your ML services. That means if my data is small, that means I have ml.t2.media machines or t2.small machines for executing it. But if I'm, my data is pretty much heavy, I have P2 based machines, P3 based machines, a GPU based bigger machines for running my humongous amount of bigger, bigger churning uh, data crunching or the machine learning model needs to be run. I have the complete fleet of infrastructure available for me. Even you can build your supercomputer stacking together a lot of, lot of um, infrastructure combined together. There are companies who have actually done that. You can even look for spot instance. Um, I forgot kind of university's name. One of the in in universities they used a 1 million spot instance combined together and they made a supercomputer, a massive computer for churning a humongous amount of data, right? So not sure. Let me just try to recollect during, du during the session time, which what exactly was this university. So all this uh, live example are available for you, how exactly they utilize those massive bigger machines. Next one, ML services. Now that's the core meat of the program for today. What is ML services, right? For my data labeling, pre-built algorithm and notebook, one-click training and deployment. The product is nothing but SageMaker, right? So you as a data scientist, till now what you have been doing is, uh, you have been using some machines on your on-premises environment, a server in your on-premises environment or on your own data center, or maybe even in, lap in your laptop. So I've been conducting sessions, uh, uh, from Amazon uh, to external customers. So one of the sessions almost three years back, which I conducted was for McKenzie. So in McKenzie, those, those data scientists, what, what exactly they're doing is they are using just their laptop. They have close to 64 GB RAM of laptop available, a massive bigger laptop. Every single data scientist available over there, they are actually doing data churning and crunching and all those things. And even their model building, training, testing in their laptop, but they, I, I would say they have not faced a big data problem yet. I mean, that, that's exactly what I would uh, name it because they just have maybe GBs of data. They're just going to take it up, put it in their laptop or in their on-premises server available and then churn or crunch it. But when you want to train or test petabyte scale of data, that's exactly where such kind of cloud, cloud provider comes in handy for you, right? And now AI services. now. In case if you don't want to use the platform or any of these existing platform services, you just want to use application as service. That means you just want to pick up one of the AWS services and you want to use it in your own environment. For simple example is something like recognition, chatbot, uh, forecasting, uh, recommendation system, and all those things. One single API call, uh, uh, okay, I, I think when I move to the next slide, it makes more sense because that's where it's, it's, it's covered. Okay, so AI services, when I say it's nothing but, for an example, we have a service known as, or an AWS has a service known as recognition. Now, what exactly is recognition? You're just going to take an image of yours, right? And then you're going to push it inside a recognition service. And it's going to do complete analysis of immediately. Within seconds, it's going to do an analysis. What exactly is that photo contained? Is the person smiling? Is the person sad? All those analytics, the facial analytics can be performed and it's going to immediately give you back the result, right? Or even what you can do is if you're going to have a, a group photo being given to this particular service and you're going to pick your own individual photos and then it can do in, in, in which of these group photos are you available? That the persons whose pictures are, are being separately provided. Don't get confused about any of this in case you are not used because that's going to be our uh, later part of the session. So some of these services we'll be covering as other ML services other, or other AI services. So today what you're going to see is ML services as SageMaker. That's going to be the core focus on this session. I'll just take a a uh, kind of a pause or anything just to see if, if any questions on things like that before we move into uh, core Amazon SageMaker. I know the first uh, 20, 30 minutes, I wanted to move a little faster so that we can have the, the, the core meat of the sessions covered better way. Any questions or are, are, we, are we good in sync? Okay, uh, silence, I will take it as okay with it. All right. Now we start with what exactly is SageMaker, right? So 
visualize an environment where you have you as a data scientist was writing your code in python or you, you've been using any of those live existing library in tensorflow and then you have been doing your training testing and validation in your own um, infrastructure in terms in your laptop or on your on-prem environment now you have around terabytes of data or petabytes of data that is needs to be churned right so how exactly are you going to do it in your existing environment it's going to take you maybe weeks time before you're going to get your complete data trained and when you get back your result now how can you sort out that issue and that's where we're going to see um, amazon SageMaker. now what exactly is this product you're going to launch SageMaker immediately it's going to come and give it to you a jupyter based notebook it's going to say okay i'm going to provide you with a jupyter based notebook you can start writing your code over there many of the existing framework which is which is um, available um, popular frameworks that is available in the market almost close to 15 to 20 frameworks are available and so you can just pick it up from a existing sample notebook which is available inside amazon examples and you can start tailoring that particular notebook and create your training models from there itself you're going to see all those things so that's the first options available for you uh, and pay per second right so you don't need to pay um, um, the moment you invoke that sage maker you will be charged based on seconds so you don't need to be in case you're not going to use it immediately your billing cycle stops over there and it supports all mxnet gluon tensorflow and all those models are all the frameworks are available for you uh, in it right now moving on so this is what we have discussed right now the the typical machine learning process problem right so in your current and on-prem environment what exactly is the process looks like your machine learning frameworks looks like first data collection you're going to collect your data there should be some source for doing that you need to do your data integration you have to do your preparation once you're done with your data preparation you have to find figure out your inference statistics right so you want to do uh, kind of like how exactly your data looks like is this, is this the proper data where you want to run your algorithm what sort of an algorithm that you want to run it so so first you want to do uh, visualization of your data how exactly you're going to, your data is going to look like so um, after that you're going to do your feature engineering model training and all these are going to be your process which you will be going through in your environment right in case you're not going to use as a platform as a service you will be relying on n number of aws services for doing this task instead what you want to do is you want to rely on a platform as service which is going to be amazon SageMaker, right so the moment you launch SageMaker, first and foremost you're going to get a jupyter notebook it's going to be a reliable gpu powered productivity ready workspace of a data scientist and developer so that's exactly your jupyter notebook next one is going to be a SageMaker algorithm as i said the n number of built-in algorithms available for you next you are going to do your training service now what you need to understand over here is the machine that you have taken for launching this notebook is not the guy who's going to come for training for you i just want to make this point repeated again so the point number one is nothing but a small instance is going to come in your environment please try to visualize it exactly the way it is so that it's easier for you to digest the concepts point number one is one small machine which is maybe an m4 x large machine came for you where you're going to write your code where you're going to write your python code or, or you're going to do your uh, the kind of data engineering that's exactly what you're going to do over here that's going to be a smaller machine right a cpu based machine right then you're going to select your algorithm and the next when you want to run your training service what you need to understand is immediately a bigger machine is going to a gpu based machine is going to come for you just for running your training process right a bigger machine massive bigger machine is going to pick up your data from somewhere that somewhere is going to be our s3 bucket it's going to pick it up from s3 bucket do this process uh, your training process the moment it gets completed it's going to automatically get dies by itself and your endpoint is going to get deployed um, um in the in the sage maker as well right so that's how exactly it's going to run so this machine is going to be different 
and this training machine is going to be different. So that's how exactly we're going to see this, um, how exactly this particular SageMaker is going to work for you. Any question over here before we deep dive uh, into this component? So this is the component that we're going to deep dive into and understand how exactly it's going to work. Okay, so no worries. I mean, all this while, if you're not able to completely come in sync with me, remaining slides are going to be something which we are going to slowly and steadily go one by one and understand component by component. And that's exactly what you're going to do in a hands-on demo as well. So I, I expect a lot more interaction during that time. Fair enough. So this is the fair level hawk's eye view of what exactly SageMaker as a product has given you. Okay. So this is the complete architectural overview. And till now, I have not asked you to be completely attentive over here, but now I want you guys complete attention over here. This is where we're going to actually start our session, right? So all this while it was a lot of stories, but this is the meat of this program. Fair enough. Okay, you can see multiple process over here. Start your training program, blah, 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 training algorithm, each and every of this step, right? We are going to see what does this stuff means. First and foremost, that you need to understand from this is, as I said, in Amazon SageMaker, there are built-in algorithms available for you. That means your XGBoost, your PCA, your uh, K-means algorithm, all these algorithms are available as a Docker container for you, right? And that is residing inside uh, elastic container re registry or ECR. Are we all good with that? There is an ECR container registry where I have my algorithm kept inside a Docker container. That's exactly what, uh, how I want you guys to visualize. Are we all in sync, right? Now let's see how exactly this process works. Now the moment I kickstart my, or I start my SageMaker or my training process, what I want to do is, uh, the moment I can start my SageMaker, what I want to do is I want to bring in my container. So think of this as my HXG boost algorithm that is available inside a Docker container, right? I'm going to bring that into my SageMaker session. That's the first step, right? Once I'm done with it, I'm going to bring, uh, so, so you can see over here, start with my training algorithm packed with, into Docker image, published into Amazon EMR. Now SageMaker, Algorithm is available inside your session and visualize this, this gray box as your session, right? So SageMaker pulled the algorithm inside the session. Now what, what more is required by this guy? He needs actual data, which you need to supply and you will be pushing that data inside NS3 bucket. The next task for you would be pull that data from S3 bucket inside the SageMaker session. I'll be all in sync till here. I may just need a confirmation now at least. Forget about all this previous slides, what we covered, but this is the time where I want you guys to be in sync with me. Are we all good till here? Whatever the process has been done. Great, uh, thank you folks, right? So now once our process is completed, so my container is sitting inside my SageMaker session, my data is also inside my SageMaker session. Now, how big you want this container? that's up to you, right? You can say, I want my container to be as big as a P4, um, uh, I think it's a P3, um, 8X large machine, or it needs to be a bigger, bigger machine. Where do you need to specify that? It's inside your code and where I'm gonna show you that part, right? Or you can even mention that I wanted to bring in a parallelism inside what I'm doing. I want not just one Docker container coming up, I want around five Docker container parallelly coming up. All those things you're going to supply as a parameter, right? So the moment I do that, in parallel, all those things are going to come up for you. Fair enough. And I have my data also. Data, there are multiple ways of bringing in data, which we're going to see. I can either pull my entire data at one shot, or it can, I can have a different format altogether where my data can be streamed. Less, less data can be pushed into each container and things like that. Fair enough. Okay, now moving on. So now think of now the training process started because the Docker container came over here. It started the training process. So once the training process is completed, it's going to come up with something known as uh, 
a model artifact which will be stored inside an S3 bucket and an inference code image also will be created inside uh, a, a registry and an ECR or Elastic Container Registry, right? So uh, there will be a model artifact as well as your image, right? So inference image also will be available over here for you, right? Now, when you deploy your model, because you created a model, now you need to deploy that model somewhere, right? So when you deploy it, that's my next process. When I deploy it, that's where you're going to get your inference code. Also, your model artifact will be called up from your S3 bucket, and I'm going to package it and create an endpoint. Right? So that's exactly what you can see over here. I create an endpoint. Now what's happening is, when you create this endpoint, you may have a massive bigger machines running over here. And this also, you can specify how exactly you want your endpoint to be catered, whether you want one single smaller machine. So the model that we have built, now we have created an endpoint. And understand, folks, this is the endpoint which you will be calling from an external application. Pull it up, and I can use it in my, in my program. All right, so that's, that's what exactly this endpoint is. Right. And the final thing that's nothing that I want to discuss right now, that's, that's nothing but the ground truth. Ground truth is um, a service, an additional service available in SageMaker where you can utilize a labeling functionality um, uh, inside Amazon uh, ground truth. We'll talk about that slightly later. Right. So that's going to be my end-to-end -end flow of creating a model or building a model by SageMaker in our environment. Any questions over here? before we actually go through now complete hands-on. And all this information are picked up from Amazon uh, documentation. Huh? You have every single thing available, how step-by-step, step, what process is, is working on. Good so far? Great. Okay, so we are going to see all these things live in action now, right? So make sure you are having registered yourself this process. Picking up a Docker container, bring up into a session, take your data, bring up into your SageMaker session, doing your, uh, the moment you build your training, the training artifacts is going to get stored inside S3 bucket. Also, your interface, uh, inference code image also is being created. And when you run your inference, both this will be combined together and I'm going to create an endpoint. And from an external application, you will be calling up this endpoint to get your predicted models, right? So I'm going to call this and it's going to give you your predictions back. That's how exactly the entire lifecycle runs. Fair enough. Okay, so that's how it works. And I'm just going to stop, uh, push this because we may not have enough time to cover the ground truth. We may be all right. So that being said, we are going to directly jump into our SageMaker sessions and things like that. I just created some backup environment as well in case um, you guys know how exactly a demo sessions would be, right? It may not work exactly the time when you really need it. So I've just created some backups uh, environment somewhere so that we are all good. Um, first and foremost, what I want to show you guys is, um, is there an area or a region where I can start everything together? Okay, let's start with, okay, SageMaker services. Where do I get it? I'm assuming everyone know how to get into our, this AWS um, um, console, provide your user ID, password, and get into AWS console. You guys are an expert in that, I'm pretty much sure. Now I've selected my North California region, right? The reason behind, nothing specific. I just want to have my demo started over here, but I'm gonna switch back to an environment where I have already created and kept it something so that we don't waste time doing that, okay. I'm in my North California now and the uh, Amazon SageMaker. I'm going to type in Amazon. Um, sorry, I missed it. It's better. Just, just put in SageMaker, right? Click on SageMaker, which is there on my left-hand side of my screen. All right. It's going to say Amazon SageMaker, build, train, and deploy machine learning models at scale, right? So that's exactly what you can see. There's a build process, there's a train process, there's a tuning, uh, hyperparameterized parameter tuning. That's also what we're gonna discuss. And then I can deploy my model, right? Make sure you're visualizing that image which we have spoken about um, some time back. All right, so where do I start my journey with? Click on notebook instance. Now, what exactly is this? This is the place where you're gonna create your Jupyter notebook, right? So how do I do that? 
click on create notebook instance. I'm going to say my notebook instance name, um, great learning notebook. Uh, I just want to have North Cal um, California NC over here, right? Notebook is coming back and asking you, okay, how big a machine you need, right? Does your re <clears throat> data crunching or do you have a humongous amount of data with you? Do your data engineering process is going to take you, uh, does that make you go for a massive bigger machine or are, are, you, are you okay with a smaller machine? That's a question it's going to ask you. So that's where you can see over here. Understand one thing, folks, this is not a machine that is responsible for training, right? Uh, let me just come back to that slide once again. So this part, not this part. For training, there is a different machine altogether going to come up. So first, to write your code, what is the machine that you require? Now, you may have your question, so why do I need to have a massive big machine just for writing my code? Understand, even your data engineering, your data, uh, the feature engineering, whatever manipulation, whatever the data massaging, data crunching, all those things, what you want to do, that should be done in this machine. That's the reason you have to choose an appropriate machine which can actually do that task for you. I'm going to pick up T2 Medium. Um, I would request you guys to just go for aws.amazon.com slash free, which says for two months, there is one machine available for you. I am assuming that's going to be a T2 Medium. We don't have a T2 Micro Machines over here, right? Um, I would assume it should be T2 Medium so that you also can exactly do this exercise by yourself without, I mean, free of cost. That's exactly what I mean, right? Um, now, the permission part of it, so you may have to create an Amazon SageMaker role. In case if you don't have one, you're just going to say create a new role option and you're going to select which S3 bucket you're interested in, or you can create all S3 bucket. I, I do already have a role in place, so I don't need to worry about it. And my assumption is you guys are pretty much aware of what exactly is the role and things like that. Now, if you have an S3 bucket where your data is residing, you can even specify only that bucket name over here. Or I'm going to say any S3 bucket. That means every single S3 bucket you have access to. Right? I don't want to do that right now because I do have uh, a role already available. Okay. Um, I'm going to stick on to complete default mode over here. And what I'm going to do is create notebook instance. Click on this. That means T2 medium machine is going to come up for me. Okay. And this process is going to take some time for you. Um, it's going to take some time before that's our first process that's got completed. Uh, Building up. One uh, question. Uh, sure, go ahead. So we selected uh, T2 medium here, right? So what is the parameter uh, on what basis I can decide uh, whether to select medium or large or extra large or something like that? Yeah, so that visibility you should be having. Basically, in case if, you're, if your data is going to be pretty heavy in, heavy or huge, and then you're going to see my data crunching. For doing my data crunching, I may need a bigger machine, right? So, so you know that there are T2 medium, T2, 8x large, 4x large sort of a machines. So I need to understand for churning my data, one GB RAM and one core processor, that's not enough. Right, so that kind of an insight you should be having yourself, because otherwise, what's going to happen? It's going to take you a massive, huge amount of time doing it, and even at times, what happens if your entire data needs to reside in memory? Even it can fail also. So that decision you should be knowing based on your cloud expertise. Uh, so that's that's yeah. where you need to. So just go and see the configuration for T2 medium and see how much is it. It's going to be two core, uh, four core processor and two GB. But now when you're going to have around 500 GB of data to be played around in this environment, it's going to say, I'm not happy with you, right? So that's exactly where you are going to make a decision. No, I cannot survive in T2 medium machine with 500 GB of data. I may want to go for a bigger machine so that I can get my data engineering process or uh, engineering um, process being processed much faster. Otherwise it's going to take you almost four or five hours for your data crunching process. Okay, but this is only during development time, right? Absolutely, yes. This is your development time. Great. Any questions or can we move forward? Uh, yeah, oh, I have one question. Uh, Go ahead. Like, uh, this instance, right, uh, it says ML.t2. So normally we don't say this ML, is this 
uh, specific to machine learning. It's that's different. correct. That's correct. You will be allowed to pick up only those machine learning. So this is customized for machine learning. So behind architecture is made in such a way that your mm -hmm. machine learning uh, kind of an engineering process, uh, these machines are customized for that. So we would not recommend you to pick up a T2 medium or, or uh, 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 like uh, what is that c4 or c5 machines to run this you pick okay. up machines only which start with ml dot blah 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 that's okay. that's a kind of machine uh, i see there is an option for uh, get repository uh, what is that uh, for and is there any option for auto scaling for that reason? yes you had um, okay let me just real quick show you that part so you can get your code bring up from git repository as well so if you have a git connected Right, so you can get your code dot from your, you can mention your repository over here and you can get your, um, I mean, the kind of CICD pipeline established over here. The moment you do um, your upload your code over there, you want to get it, you, your credential needs to be supplied over here and that data can be pushed in. It can be pulled from your Git. So that's exactly, I mean, I have not done much of that activities, but yeah, so once just for a POC purpose, I've, I've done that, that part. So that's what the Git is. And okay, one thing which you mentioned, I guess I, I missed that part. Where did you see inference part, um, elastic inference? Or, or you, your own experience you're talking about? Or you did not see it over here, right? No, uh, I didn't see it uh, over here. Maybe an additional configuration. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not an additional configuration. So the elastic inference is not available in North California right now. That, that's the reason for it. Okay, so I'm just going to show you that. I'm just going to come out of this. Um, I'm just going to cancel this. Okay. So Elastic Inference is available. Maybe, yeah, so our Ju Jupyter Notebook is anyways ready, but we're not going to run over here. We're going to run this process inside Ohio, where, let me just real quick show you Elastic Inference as well. Uh, create a notebook. I guess it should be available over here. Right, you can see over here elastic inference. Yeah, so that feature is not. So I'm assuming you guys know that uh, the moment AWS uh, deploy a feature, they are not going to do it a GA, right? That means global availability. So they don't they don't do it to the entire. Uh, uh, I guess now AWS have around 21 or 22 regions. They are not going to deploy this new feature to the entire 23 region. Instead, they're going to do first a pilot or the beta version in. Uh, North Virginia and maybe a couple of more other region, right? After that, once they are completely um, confident about uh, the services features, a, a customer traction and all those bug fixing and everything has been done or, or uh, more features customers are asking, once they introduce more and feature and functionality to it, then they are going to push that to the remaining part of the region. So that's, that's the kind of approach um, AWS does. So you would not have seen that feature in North California, but you can see that feature over here. Now, Elastic Inference is this guy. Um, I'm going to go back to my slide now. Uh, you can see over here the last thing which we spoke about. Yeah. The endpoint. Remember this guy? Yeah. This endpoint, when I deploy this endpoint, think of now where do you call this from? Maybe you have uh, greatlearnings.com web page, and when you click on one single button, that's the time that API will be called. And along with that button, you would have already supplied the parameter as well. I mean, the, your, your, your training data, or sorry, not the training, your actual data, right? And immediately it's going to hit this endpoint and it's going to do that model will be run on top of it and it's going to immediately give you back the result. I'm, I'm not sure whether you guys are all able to sync it up, right? So think of now greatlearning.com, the website. And from there, you have supplied data to the a small text box is available over there where you supplied your data. And the moment I click on a button, immediately that needs to call up this endpoint, do the uh, modeling, uh, come back with the prediction result, and that result should be displayed at the next line on the great learning uh, website page, right? Now think of you're going to create a massive big CSV file, it has around uh, 1 million records available inside that. That's the kind of data you're supplying. The moment you go and hit this endpoint, what's going to happen? It's going to take a huge amount of time before it can process and send back the result to you, right? 
that's when your elastic inference is going to come in handy for you. What it's going to tell you is in case if your data is going to be massive big, based on that, multiple similar kind of an instance will keep coming up and it's going to process it all for you and it's going to send back result. The moment you are done with it, it's going to die by itself, right? That's the elasticity we are talking about over here. So we're going to go back and cancel this and we have our notebook available over here, right? So now our notebook is ready. You can see over here, the SageMaker open Jupyter notebook. Yeah, that's it. Um, I thought it, it was there over somewhere over here. I think they changed some features again. All right. So what you did is you have created a Jupyter notebook now, right? So the moment you create a Jupyter notebook and you have some machine learning data to be crunched and, and things like that, it took you almost five hours, but you don't need to keep this T2 medium machines running throughout, right? It, it's going to incur some cost for you. Instead, what I want to do is, I'm just going to immediately take this and stop it over here. No charge incurred, right? So that's how exactly you should be doing it in case if you don't want to just terminate it. In case we want to do some experiment, even tomorrow, you may just end or you may just stop this machine and no charges incurred for the compute purpose. Otherwise, your clock is ticking now. Fair enough. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just open a Jupyter notebook, <clears throat> bike sharing demand data. So I, I'll send this repository to you folks. Yeah, this is exactly the data which you have, which you're playing around with, right? So I have the, the Kaggle. So what we are trying to find over here is uh, there is, um, this is the 2011 and 2012 uh, rental bike data. That means uh, on 2000, 2011, how much, how many number of bike on what hour has been actually taken up from some, some location? So that's the kind of data it's available over here. So think of now in real time scenario, uh, if you are someone, uh, a CEO of Yulu, Yulu bikes that is available in Bangalore now, right? So using this data you can figure out in 2020 or 2019 december how many number of bike that you require so that i meet my uh, customer needs and i can run much profitable business and what are the things i need to take care in terms of which location should i be placing my bikes and things like that right so what they have done is they've given you a data set a live data set of one of the company um, and their test uh, or the training data is from um, Jan 1st to Jan 19th, Feb 1st to Feb 19th, right? So till 19th or 20th, I believe. Yeah. So let's make it as I think it should be available till 20th, right? So the first month of till 20th data is available as a training data for you every month. So Jan till 20th, Feb till 20th, uh, March till 20th, all those data is available for you. And from 21st till end of the month, they made it as a test data for you, right? So what you have to do is using your model, you have to do the prediction, what would be your actual sales or how many number of bikes will be going for rental during 21st till the end of month. So that is something which you need to predict and give it to the Kegel. I mean, if you submit it, you have to see your prediction score and things like that. A lot more details available for you over here if you want to try it on your own as well, right? So this is how exactly the data looks like and I have downloaded all this data. This is where, uh, then this is how the data looks like for you. So you have inside the data, your date time, your season, holiday, working day, whether you have some categorical data, uh, some numerical data, and all those things are available for you, right? This is how exactly it looks like. Um, okay, uh, so now I'll go back. So I have just taken this data, did some customization here and there. It's not working perfectly fine for me, but I'll be sharing this um, IPython notebook with you guys once I get my uh, entire setup. There is something getting goofed up in this environment. Uh, open Jupyter notebook. <clears throat> so I should not have anything available right now. So just want to show you how exactly you can get your uh, notebook instance or your code being brought in. Right. So first and foremost, I have around uh, three sets of data. Um, so I wanted to bring in my data as well as my, yeah, that's, that's going to be my data. So these are the data set which I want to bring into my uh, environment, right? So, so test and train data, which you would have already seen in the Kegel data set. Um, that's the first. Yeah, and so let me just upload that. 
So it looks like I'm just uploading it. And the remaining files as well. Let me just pick up the remaining files. That's going to be my three files, which I am having open and upload. So once I've done with my complete, um, I may have to do some tweaking to get it uh, working perfectly. Uh, it, it's, it's showing some sort of uh, haywire result right now. So once I'm sorted out that uh, issue, I will be sharing this uh, Jupyter notebook with you guys so that, so that you, can, you can play around from your end. Okay, so that's my test. And the first and foremost, what I want to do is I want to do some data preparation. That's my Sage Maker notebook. One other thing what I want to tell you guys is in case if you're pretty new to this Sage Maker environment and if you want to just kickstart, you have not so familiar with writing any model, creating all those things, Amazon itself has created a Sage Maker example one. You can see over here deep learning AR, um, Amazon algorithm, you can have your LDA. Um, K nearest neighbor and all those available notebooks are available for you. Click on it. You can start putting your data and start your innovation over here. Or, or even there are many of those notebooks, which is even having the notebook, uh, sorry, even having the data inbuilt inside. It's going to uh, retrieve it from one of the S3 bucket and it's going to start doing your processing for you. So it's, it's a much easier environment to start your journey with, right? But what we are trying to do over here is, we already have some built-in algorithm available, so we're going to play around with that. Um, so in files, I have all this down, uh, uploaded in, inside my SageMaker now. First and foremost, my data preparation. That's my data re-engineering part. Feature engineering, or I want to do some data massaging over here, right? So let me just do a... So I can, so I have already run this process and I'm, I'm assuming you guys are familiar with Jupyter Notebook, uh, right? So you can, you can use it as a cell. You can, you can have your comments being written over here and all those things, right? Um, that may be slightly beyond the scope over here and you can have it as a markup code or a markup language, blah, 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 right? All those things. And what I want to do is I just want to do a restart and clear output so that we can run it all from the beginning, right? Restart and clear all output. So in SageMaker, you have all your Panda libraries, NumPy, everything, MATLAB, everything installed for it. So you don't need to do a separate installation of any of these libraries. It comes with pre-built libraries of all. So I'm just doing, <clears throat> these are my entries. I'm, I'm importing um, matplotlib so, for my, so that I can just plot and see how exactly my visualization station looks like. I'm importing NumPy, Pandas for doing my uh, data processing, right? And I can just do a run over here or in your um, Windows as well as the uh, Mac, it should be control enter. The moment I do that, I should have my process running, right? Uh, it's importing NumPy. Yeah, this process completed, right? I'm going to go back. This is nothing but I just want to fit. This is how exactly your columns look like, right? So if you would have seen that Kegel data set, that's how exactly your Kegel data set looks like, right? So that's, that's where we have set up the column and kept it exactly the way it is. Uh, not really so relevant over here. Now what I'm trying to do is I'm reading train.csv as well as test.csv, which is available from your... Um, um, Kegel data set. That's exactly where we picked it up from. I'm going to load that into my SageMaker. It did not like something. What it did not, what is it giving me? So this, mm, I may have to use one more file where I have done my parsing with date and time. So I may have to just use my existing process, which I've run. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of know what exactly is that. Uh, so I have another library available, which I was doing for my data because I don't have that much time to do that. So what we're going to do is, uh, so I, I'll correct this, this module when I'm going to send it across to you guys. So instead, what I rely now on would be on my data set that's available on, right? and we'll try to see uh, a processed I, I did for, want to start from scratch and fresh. 
Um, yeah, so that's GL SageMaker. That's exactly what I did. Uh, so this is this is the entire thing that you can see over here. And my bike training preparation. This is my data preparation part. Uh, let me just show you how exactly an um, already executed one looks like. Right, so this is where we have executed. Uh, my train and test data got executed. I have just loading my uh, train.csv as well as test.csv into my data set, and I'm naming it as df and df underscore uh, test. Uh, just to see, uh, remember what I said? One, two, let's see whether it's 19 or 20th. No, it's actually 19th, right? So January 1st to January 19th. Uh, Feb 1st to Feb 19th. So that's exactly the kind of data you can see. So just to show that I've just listed down over here, right? So till 19th data is what is getting listed over here, right? Which is available inside your uh, train.csv, which will be provided by Kaggle for you. So that's how exactly. So you can see 420, uh, 30th records is of 19th and 31st is belong to um, Feb 1st. Right, fair enough. Okay, and I'm just trying to display over here my head records. You can see over here how exactly your data looks like. Now, what we want to do is I just want to split this particular date uh, into year, month, day, and week. So that's that's exactly what you're trying to do over here. Right, so add features. And I have extracted this date and I'm just pushing it into so that I can have my hourly based data available for me. That's the whole and sole reason behind it. Right, so that's what we are trying to achieve over here. So once I'm done with that, uh, so that's that's the uh, feature I'm adding to it. And you can see over here, df.type. So I have just added, based on this function, I've added year, month, day, and week, hour. So that's exactly what I added at the end of my data set. Right? So it's just cleansing my data. I'm doing my data uh, feature engineering part. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Now, I'm not sure whether I have executed this part. Uh, no, right? So yeah, so it, it, I, I may end up having trouble showing you this part. So, so I'm just doing my correlation. Um, so that's, that's, that's. Uh, so what, what I'm seeing over here is I have my maximum correlation with our, so I, I just goofed it up now. Uh, so you should have, you can see in this recording just previous. Um, and, and when I'm going to uh, send across this particular file for you, you can try it out, try it out yourself, right? Um, and what we are trying to do is we are trying to take a mean hour, right? So, if, so, so how exactly you need to visualize this? I have this entire data set available with me. This is my data set. So what you're trying to do over here is, um, so what you need to understand is I have just appended my hour, day, time, everything with my existing data. And I'm just plotting it. That's, that's as simple as that. And in the plot, what I'm seeing over here is hourly base, this is how exactly my data looks like. That means zeroth hour, the number of bikes that has gone for running from one location is going to be like close to maybe 60 or something. This is uh, 12 in the midnight. And one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, you can see it's slightly dipping. And then when it slightly increases when the day proceeds, right? So eight in the morning, you can see a huge number of guys are using those rental bikes. So 350 bikes are being used eight in the morning. And nine again, it started dipping. And somewhere over, over here at 10, it's again dipped. And you can see over here at the evening time, again, the rental bikes, maximum number of guys are using the rental bikes, right? 450 plus, at, what is the time period? You can see over here at around five o'clock, again, the maximum number of usage happens. So that's exactly what this plot is showing you. Fair enough. So, I mean, it's, it's quite obvious, right? So on a, on, a, on a normal day, when you go to office, many of people might be using, it's, it's a US-based data. Many of those guys are using those rental bike and also they're using those rental bikes during, um, uh, during um, evening when they come back from office. So that's why the peak uh, peak over here. Right. So now we are just grouping it based on count of means. That's that's exactly what we did. Now what we want to do is we want to use this data to be processed by two years. So it's available for 2011 as well as 2012. So that's the data it's available for you over here. So we are just going to take this data and use average hour or index level. And I'm just going to utilize this 
exact same code which ha which we have utilized and this is what i can see as my data right i can see my data in 2011 it looks like this blue line and 2012 it's exactly the similar kind of a trend that has been followed but only thing is the slightly higher in number right so if you are a yulu guy and if you want to make a prediction 2013 it's much easier for you to figure out how many number of bike should i be keeping it one location and and if you have an entire different data set which talks about which location am i concentrating on we using that data you can say okay in the month uh, in the year of 2013 i should be having somewhere close to close to 600 plus bike kept in in somewhere in new york or somewhere somewhere exactly on what city or what location right so that's the kind of insight that you can derive from, from this from this um plotting right uh group by hours i'm just going to and then what we are trying to do over here is we have split this data into working hours and so you can see in the kegel data set you had one was a working day if it's going to be um whether the day is night or a weekend okay so that's going to be if it's going to be a one that's going to be a working day and if it's going to be zero that's going to be a non working day right so that's that's how exactly the data looks like so in case and that is exactly the kind we utilized over here sorry let's yeah right so what i'm doing i'm doing another plot over here what it says is if it's going to be one that means it's a working day my chart looks exactly the same right uh, that means eight in the mo eight in the morning it's uh, the peak uh, increases and um, five in the evening also my peak is pretty much high whereas uh, i can see the data set over here uh, it's on on a non working day or on a holiday i can see later close to 12 o'clock because people people might be lazing around they might be sleeping till uh, till 10 in the morning and close to 12 o'clock they might be setting up to move somewhere so on a non working day this is the time period when you can see maximum guys are going to use the use the bike right so that's the kind of inference we have made over here all right df.csv and now what we are trying to do is um, save all the data so i have kept all the data inside bike underscore all csv that's what we did and now what we are trying to do is we are trying to split that existing data into 70 30 ratio so i'm i'm assuming everyone is aware of this concept of we are trying to split it 30 percentage of the training data and the remaining 3 percent um, 30 percent 70 percentage is going to be my training data and the remaining 30 percentage of data i'm going to use for my test purpose right so that's the split i'm going to do and that's exactly what this remaining code is going to do for me right so when i do this you can see over here count given over here right so all together there were 10886 and my training data is going to be this much and my test data is going to be like 3000 plus training is going to be 7000 plus so that's how exactly i split my data and i create it as bike underscore train and i create as bike underscore validation um, and split it up to into two right the 30 percentage is going to be and bike underscore validation and this is my data which is from um from 20th till end of the end of the what uh, month that data is residing over here of every month so jan 20th till 30th data is available feb 20th till 28th or 29th or whatever that data is available over here feb so all those data combined together is available for you in the for your testing purpose right and i just create that particular data and this is available for me as this this format okay now moving on i'm assuming no question over here because you guys would have done this n number of times you are now the key part what you want to uh, talk about is would be how exactly i wanted to do a training process that's the meat of this program right uh, and the prediction one we may not be having enough time for that part so what i will be doing is i'll be sharing this files with you guys we have a small data prediction done with this file itself let me just check whether i have um and what we'll do is we you can run this on your own uh with this this particular bike train um underscore prediction right so what you're going to do, do is the existing deployment that we have done that deployment you will be running through prediction right so that's that's a task which is there for you fair enough okay now bike training how exactly what we did my i have imported all my modules and blah 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 now what you want to do is 
you wanted to get create an S3 bucket first. So I have created SPK underscore SageMaker underscore uh, EDU or blah, blah, blah. So let me just go and show you that part. Uh, I'm just going to go to services, right click, open up, and then show my S3 bucket services and S3. Oh, yeah, so the name of this <coughs> SPK <coughs> SageMaker. So SPK SageMaker, that's, that's my bucket, right? Inside that I created a bike train folder. Uh, I did not create it. Basically, I just have to uh, keep that. My process over here is going to automatically do that for you, right? So training file is bike train slash um, everything is done for you. So you just need to create this SPK underscore SageMaker dot edu or basically whatever the s3 bucket that you want to create right and the moment you execute this you're going to set it up like you will have something like bike train spk sage maker edu slash bike train slash bike underscore train slash bike underscore validation all this data will be going and residing over here the moment you do this execution right so you can see over here this is how exactly it looks like fair enough Nothing, nothing. I mean, this is something which you guys should be familiar with. So not, not going to go uh, deep over there. And now what you're trying to do over here is this is where you're actually going to upload your data, right? So you can see over here, write to S3. That's the function that I've written. File name, bucket and key, right? So we're going to call this function somewhere over here. Write to S3. This is my bike uh, underscore train dot CSV file, which is going to get uploaded inside this particular data set. So that's my bike underscore model, bike underscore train, and bike underscore validation. These three data set are gonna get uploaded when you execute this command, right? So that three data set is uploaded. And what you can see over here is, you remember we have spoke about uh, our model artifacts will be stored in S3, and that's exactly what you can see over here. S3 model output location, where exactly you want those, once you process your data, where exactly you want your artifact to get stored over here, that's exactly what you're going to mention over here, right? And you can see where exactly that particular uh, variable is getting used. Now, all these things were something which you would have done n number of times. Don't need to have a lot of clarification or, or something is required over here. Now, over here, the next cell is pretty, pretty important for you. Now, what you're trying to do over here is we are trying to do an X, XG boost algorithm on top of that uh, bike train data set. I'm, my assumption is you guys are pretty familiar what exactly is an XG boost, right? So we are not going to get into that topic. Um, fair enough understanding, or maybe you just need to Google it and figure it out what exactly is XG boost. So just a layman terminology, multiple trees. Okay, uh, just to give you a, a very, very high level hawk's eye view for those of you guys who does not understand a layman term. Um, a multiple model combined um, or a multiple tree combined together to form a, a, a pretty pretty good uh, estimation for me. That's exactly what, how I would I uh, would call an XG boost race, right? So um, so that that's at a high level what you should take it as, right? Or if you're interested, just go search for XG boost. There is a pretty good explanation given over there uh, to understand what exactly is that. Now the the core understanding that you need to have over here is now where do I get this XG boost algorithm? That's something which you need to know. I'm going to go back to my slide. Remember, we spoke about there is a container available over here, right? I need to bring a container which is filled with XGBoost algorithm written inside. That is what I want to bring into my SageMaker session. Now, how do I do that, right? So where do I get that container? That's the question I should be asking. So I'm going to open up this particular documentation from AWS, control V and enter, right? So this documentation, let me even send that across to you guys straight away. Yeah, so now what it's talking about is in case whatever algorithm that you're gonna use is gonna be blazing text, this is exactly the path you need to find out. Colon tag is nothing but if you're gonna use a previous version or the latest version. So by default, if you don't use a tag, it's going to be treating it as a latest version. You can see over here, the instance class can be a GPU-based instance or a CPU-based instance for my uh, blazing text. 
Uh, so I'm going to search for my existing algorithm, which I'm going to use. You can see over here completely. I'm going to search for XG boost. So basically what I need to use is I need to use ECR underscore path slash XG boost inside my, uh, my algorithm, which is, which looks like this. So where did I get this one? So, so this is exactly what I should be using now. Where would I get this information? Oh, I'm sorry. Where would I get this information? ECR path. Just scroll down. You can see over here. If you're going to use which, whichever environment you're going to use or whichever the model for, we are searching for XGBoost, right? So in XGBoost, LDA. Yeah, there you go. So for XGBoost, I need to rely on, uh, yeah, for point 0.9, I believe this was point nine, which you utilize. Yeah. So I need to rely on this particular. So in case if I'm going to run it in US West one, West two or East one I used to, this is what I need to use. Right. So blah, blah, blah. This is where exactly what, this is exactly what my ECR is elastic container registry. Right. And that is exactly what I have used over here. You can see over here container registry that has been used and slash XG boost and latest, right? We want to pick up the latest one. So it, so you can get this run in US West 2, East 1, East 2, US East 2 and EU West 1, right? In case if you want to go for any other region, that's up to you. So you can just pick up corresponding region of your choice and you have to just fill in that particular container registry information over here. Fair enough. I'm assuming everyone is fine with that part. So this is where your container is going to get pulled, right? Now you have to have a corresponding role also, right? The one which remember the first when we created our uh, SageMaker, we created a role. That's exactly what this role is, right? And now you can see over here how exactly I can build my model. Now the beauty of SageMaker is, okay, let, let's start with this part and then talk about the, the SageMaker one, right? So now remember we spoke about how exactly your SageMaker would look like. So I'm going to say for training my instance, I need an M1, M4 X large machines, right? Remember for our, for our training purpose, we have actually spinned up a machine, which was like, remember this machine was just um, T2 media machine, right? This is our Jupyter notebook machines, but for the training purpose, I'm going to define over here. I need an instance, which is going to be my M1 dot uh, M4 dot X large machine, right? M sorry, ML dot M4 dot X large machine, right? It's not M1, it's ML, ML dot, right? So machine learning. Um, and I'm going to say my count is just needs to be one. Now you're thinking you have a humongous amount of data. Now you wanted to have a parallel process also in place. In that case, you may want to increase this count. Now you may ask a question, how do I know whether I need one count or whether I need four count? That's mere sheer experience. We have just tried to play around with, at times we get a better result with one, at times it has been turned out that we are going to make it three or four machines that gave a better result. It's just a parallelism. How exactly you can bring in the parallelism in case your model execution, you may have to slightly play, play around with, because if you just bring in parallelism, but your data cannot do that slicing or a streaming, still your parallelism is not going to work and it's not of any good use for you. You need to understand all those parameters in place, right? And then I'm going to name my uh, job as this one. And that's, that's all the parameter that you require, right? And now I need to, uh, any questions over here? Let me just take a um, pause over here before we go to the next part. Any questions still here? Because that, that's where you may have a logical, are we all good till here or? Oh, sorry. Uh, there was some question from someone. You need to execute. Yeah. So, um, sorry. Uh, someone has asked. You have to DF. No, it's not going to work because because I've done some data processing prior to this. There was a multiple version of my data processing one. So that's not going to do. Uh, even if I do that DF, that's going, not going to work for me uh, because I've done some tweaking with a different uh, IPython model uh, module available for me, which which I slightly goofed up. But yeah, so even if I execute it exactly the same way, uh, you will get exact same results. Sorry, any questions or are we all good till here? Or is it is it becoming 
so make sure you are you guys are in sync with me so this process is nothing but the docker container that was being brought in from here right so as i said from here whether should i be bringing one docker container or should i be bringing four different docker container over here that's exactly the question that you should be asking over here so that that part has been covered over here okay um my assumption is uh, silence is actually a little deadly um you either you understood it thoroughly completely or you didn't understand it anyway right so if it's the in between stage there is going to be a lot of questions but okay i will take this assumption as your your okay kind till till here right okay now this is one of the key part which you need to understand in terms of hyperparameter right so a beauty of sage maker is um you can supply your hyperparameter to your algorithm for now for an xg boost these are my hyperparameters so maximum depth maximum depth is nothing but the number of uh, leaf that i can go that's exactly what um, sorry the number of hierarchical structure that i can go is what your maximum depth is for your xg boost right um and something num round is talks about an objective function which i'm going to use is uh, linear and num round is nothing but how many iteration that i need to go um or how many jobs should be run executing that i'm i'm specifying over here my total number of job execution should be 150 right so 150 times uh this job is going to run for you before it's going to finalize and give you a um optimal model right so that's exactly what it means now so i've just listed down over here that's how exactly it looks like x estimator dot hyperparameter is going to be this value but the key point of what you need to understand over here is there is a function available in terms of hyperparameter i'll even send you this link i have not stored this link for you so i can have this num round parameter the continuous parameter which can go for 1 to 200 my lambda or my learning rate right when i talk about my eta is nothing but my learning rate over here i'm going to say here my learning rate is fixed 0.1 so instead i can set my learning rate from 0.1 to 0.9 right so what this range means is sage maker behind the scene it's going to play around with this hyperparameter values right and it's going to find out which is the best algorithm which is resulted into and it's going to flash out that particular hyperparameter for you and that's a very very great uh information or an insight for you so i can finalize okay if i use maximum depth of 5 and if i use objective um as a linear and if my eta is 0.1 and my sub sample is 0.7 that's going to be my best model right but where did i get this information from i have just given a range specified over here it it should range from 0.01 to 10 for my alpha for my lambda it needs to be 0.01 and 10 and for my num round it should range from 1 to 200 that means the number of iteration can range from 1 to 200 so what sage maker behind the scene is going to run is it's going to pick up randomly one of this parameter and it's going to keep trying up right so every single parameter which is range specified over here will be picked as a parameter and it's going to do that execution and in one of these places if you go over here in sage maker's console if you see in hyperparameter tuning job if you click on this right now you will not be seeing any data over here right over here you can see that 150 execution over here and you can see on the extreme right what is your objective function and which is given you a minimal uh, data available over there that means minimal um functions whichever the metrics that you define over here for that corresponding what are the parameter that is getting used right which is going to be in my case i have picked it up as these were the best parameter that i can supply for this execution and i picked it up from there and i start utilizing it so in case if you want to use this model in the later point of time i know that that's the function or that's the metric that i should be using for each of these parameters right and and that's going to give you a much better result right so this is not something which i use i've just picked it up from a sample um uh, sage maker documentation from uh, from amazon documentation so that you know this is how exactly you can specify a hyperparameter range 
right? You can stay, state it as alpha continuous parameter range, and this is the range I'm specifying over here. And then I'm going to have that tuner linear hyperparameter tuner. And you can see over here, this range, hyper range linear is what I mentioned over here, right? And then I'm going to call my fit function, right? The tuner uh, underscore linear dot fit function. The moment I call up my fit function is what your training is going to happen. You can see that uh, happening over here at right? estimator dot fit. You're going to have supply uh, X Gbo's parameter over here, and you can see your training jobs is going to get kicked off. And this is how exactly your training job is going to get kicked off. Right, you can see uh, we have specified the number of iteration, which is going to be this feed, num job field or num round field, which is going to be 150. You can see your job has executed for 150 times over here. Right? And you can see over here, to start with, your RMSC error is going to be 242 to start with, and your validation error was 240. With each iteration, you can see that the parameter is going to get reduced for you. I can see that parameter is going to get reduced. When I reach almost 100, my parameter reaches close to somewhere around 50. And when I reach close to 150th execution of that particular algorithm, I can see it's pretty much close to um, what for my best RMSC root mean square error, right? I'm assuming you guys know all this, what exactly the RMSC is, right? You can see over here, it it is going to be my 41 and that's where 150th execution has resulted into 41.45, slightly lesser than this, yeah. Right, so that's where we define our learning rate and our um, RMSC is defined over here. And you can see the number of execution, the billable seconds for that particular execution is 64 seconds, right? You will be charged for this M4 machine that you spin up, this ML.M4.xcharge machine, you will be charged for 64 seconds. That's exactly what it means apart from the data transfer and all those costs, but your training instance charge will be just for 64 seconds. Compare this with the way you're doing traditionally. Traditionally, what you might, be, might have been doing is you would have taken up an ML dot uh, um, P3 dot machine, which is going to be a massive GPU based machine, right? And for writing your code also, you're using exactly that particular G, um, uh, G, um, uh, GPU machine. Also for training purpose, also you're going to use your machine. So the, the time that you're using it is completely wasted when you're actually, you as a data scientist, when you're writing your model, when you're preparing your data, you're doing your data engineering, during that time, you are actually using a GPU-based machine. But over here, only during the training, training time, your GPU-based machines are going to come up, and which is going to be just 64 seconds. And you have been built for that GPU-based machine only for 64 seconds, whatever you have specified over here. Right, so that's exactly what's happening over here. And once I'm done with my execution, I get my model created and next, uh, the code I'm gonna explain is instance type for my inference purpose. That's gonna be my again, m 4 x large, and I can have my endpoint created as uh, xgboost dot by uh, train hyphen v1. So what is gonna happen is, I'm just gonna show you this which I have already executed. So the moment I do this execution, what's going to happen is I'm just going to go to my um, North Virginia region where I could see, um, I'm assuming I still have my endpoint deployed over there. Oh, did I remove it? Oh, no, yeah. So that's exactly what my, so the moment you're done with that execution part, you are going to get automatically an endpoint created over here. And this is the endpoint. If I click on this endpoint, you can see over here an HTTPS link is going to get created. And from your external application, you're going to call this API. You're going to make an API call for this endpoint, right? And you're going to get your um, results executed. That's how exactly you're going to perform your um, training over here. So we have done, I've just done a small data prediction over here, just supplying this particular data to this predictor and it's giving me a result back. So for this, based on this particular data, 
the number of bikes that is required would be 39. Uh, so three in the evening, that, that, that's exactly what it would be. So 39 bikes are required over here. That's exactly the count it has resulted into, right? So that's how you're going to do your end-to-end -end, um, deployment as well as prediction part. Um, any quick questions? Let me just open the floor for questions for the remaining 10 minutes that's available. And I'll, I'll, I'll do those corrections, whatever required over here, and I'll, I'll um, post it into your uh, repository wherever you can just pick it up and run it on your own environment itself, right? Uh, any question anywhere, if you want to go back and then. Hi, uh, can we uh, spin up a, uh, let's say a Docker from any other registry apart from ECR? Um, I have not done that. Uh, apart from ECR, I doubt that's a possible. So let me just take down the question. Um, yeah, that didn't come in my mind either. So I would assume that may not be possible. But just to, I mean, yeah, it's a nice way of uh, a trainer doing it, right? So instead of answering your direct question, I uh, pick up another question out of your question and then answering it. So that question, whatever you asked, I um, frankly and openly, I don't have an answer to it. Can we go for anywhere? I doubt that will be possible because easier then you may have to have a lot of configuration changes. So my gut feeling is would not be possible, but you can bring your own model. You can create a Docker container out of it and then you can bring it into an ECR and you can make a call from there, right? So that is possible for you. But if you don't like ECR, mm, I doubt. Sure, thank you. No problem, yeah. So that's, that's a pretty good question. Um, I should have given you that insight as well. So in case if you, are, if you want to bring in your own custom model, create that model and that can be pushed into our ECR registry and I can just call it from there. Well, that's possible for you. I'll just check back, but my gut feeling or my 90%, we're talking about confidence interval, right? So that's 90% of the confidence interval of mine says it may not be possible because that's, uh, there might be a huge amount of changes required in that case, yeah. Uh, any more question, folks? Yeah, and also, also um, just want to give you a heads up. So the predict one, the one which I have file over here, I think I may have to do some tweaking over there as well. The, the prediction, I'm going to send it across to you. It's a pretty small file. You can just execute on your own end with the test data. Remember, we have created bike underscore test. The moment you execute it, you're going to get that result result part. So this is how, so the, the reason behind I said there is tweaking required because I am getting slightly a haywire results. I have goofed it up somewhere and I was not able to find out solution. So I can see my data is coming up with, with massive, um, it, it's predicting around uh, a huge number, in fact. So somewhere I have goofed it up. I may have to do some tweaking and find out where exactly. And you yourself can do that part. It, it's the, This notebook is something which I'm going to share it with you guys. So you can run it on bike underscore uh, test dot CSV, which will be available with you when you, the moment you execute those uh, commands. You're able to link to the concept. Um, my uh, am I, is my assumption okay I, I did not actually clarify my assumption first but I, even if you say no i'm not a data scientist we, it would not have been a room where we will be able to spend time of doing that but my because our assumption or a prerequisite was you have to have some sort of a model building um, exercise being carried out you know what is training validation testing and all those things so that was expectation and also expectation was you need to have a fair of bit of information about how exactly cloud environment works. So these two information in place, I guess it should be, we should be all in sync. But any questions, please feel free to shoot. We have enough time. What's, what do you think was a missing link apart from one execution part of it? Uh, I just wanted to have a fresh environment created. That's, that's something which, which goofed up slightly because otherwise we could have done uh, an execution over here uh, which is available for me over here. So if you see my North Virginia, uh, it's North Virginia, yeah. Uh, and my notebook instance, uh, is it up and running? Yeah, my Jupyter is up and running. So I have multiple data processing files available with me, right? So I have just tweaked it and kept it on the other one. And SageMaker one. Yeah, so these were, um, the multiple version available for this. So which I, I 
created, took this and embedded on top of this and made this. So in between, I missed some couple of steps, uh, which may take a lot of time for again doing that repair activity. But that's exactly what the execution I did some time back. So that should be fine. There's nothing different that you're going to see as an out, uh, output. Apart from a slow motion wise, you may see one by one that's getting executed. Other than that, not, other than that nothing. But yeah, I mean, uh, just want to have your um, valid feedback. Like, uh, do you think anything can be done um, uh, to improve this program, or or what do you think? Uh, what do you think can be best done? It, it's just it's a mutual um, help, right? So where do you think? If this was done slightly in this manner, that would have been much beneficial for me as a participant. It's fair, fair enough ask. So if you have something of that sort, please do throw in your lights or your comments so that we can improve this program based on how you think that can be improved. If you don't have any questions, huh? by the way, if you have questions, please shoot your questions. But otherwise, if you think, no, if this, this, this module has been slightly more elaborated, yeah, I. I think that's, that's something which I would be able to understand much better. Or this portion I was not very clear about, such kind of discussion or information is what we would like to have. Absolutely nothing. So we are seven minutes ahead of time. So is it like the moment I give this file, you will be able to create it on your own and then, then run the process without, I mean, without any hassle? Is that, is that what you think? So you are becoming uh, a SageMaker enabled data scientist. Shum, today on. Hi, uh, can we uh, integrate any visualization uh, data tools uh, with this? With SageMaker? Yes. Uh, SageMaker itself, uh, you're telling, can I connect it with a... Uh, um, Power BI. Power BI or... Um, I may not know what would be the real, because, because as a visualization part, we actually can have uh, um, any of the plotting or anything being done over here itself. Is there any other additional services that you can connect? I may have to check. My gut feeling is um, cannot be. Can we connect any visualization tool? But um, where would you think would that be a real necessity? Because I mean, you can have an um, um, an API call for QuickSight can be enabled. I'm not sure. I, mean, I have never done it because I was always happy with uh, the kind of either Matplot or even the existing Python uh, visualization. Some of those APIs that has been given is what I have always used. So I have not tried connecting with any other additional services, but I uh, can check and come back to you on that. Because do you do that uh, whenever you're running that on your Jupyter notebook mm -hmm. uh, in your current current environment? Do you actually rely on some other visualization as well? Uh, not really. Uh, okay. So we have a different team. Uh, so in that case, uh, what they do is they actually pull up the data manually and okay. uh, create uh, like utilize that and create a like use it in, with a visualization. Got it, got it. You, you separately you want to have a much more uh, enriched kind of a visualization, so you rely on Tableau or any of the other tool and yeah. before you actually bring in your data. Got it, got it, yeah. Uh, but in that case, maybe you may have to do the exact same exercise over here as well is what I feel because um, I think, so this is a container way, blah, blah, blah. I, I doubt whether that will be possible. But but yeah, I, to be frank, I don't have the yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. You can use matplotlib and c packages, which is quite good. Yeah, true. So that's the matplotlib, matplotlib is what we use and the c packages is exactly. So exactly the way you're using your Jupyter notebook, you can use exactly the same way. But connecting to an external source, that's something. something. Normally, a data scientist don't use it, but but yeah, you never know. So there, might, there can be remote kind of scenario that can you can end up with, right? But yeah, uh, that's that's something new. That's something even I will try to find out from my, my end as well. Yeah, that's true. Data scientists don't business analyst mostly does. <clears throat> yeah, but but I would say when I'm doing my data engineering and trying to run my training testing, there was no need ever. I have never seen a practical scenario where uh, a 
a business analyst also had to do it unless and until I'm processed my data and send it across and then they're doing it, right? So that's, that's a different uh, arena altogether, right? So that's not really my data enriching in terms of model building. Before I get my model, absolutely. I mean, the gentleman who asked this question is absolutely right, right? So before I even get into this part, I just want to do a, a good amount of visualization. Yeah, that, that's a fair ask. But in between, in a Jupyter notebook, I've not seen many guys doing that. Okay, sorry, any more questions, folks? Um, we have two minutes short. If not, we can just wind up in case we don't have any questions. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm assuming you guys... Um, not sure how length and breadth has been that information has been covered, but yeah, I would really appreciate if you guys could provide your information. If you don't want to speak up, uh, please do provide your information in that uh, the link that's been provided by ECTA so that we can make this uh, much better program. In case if you say uh, any 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 small details is really going to help us. It's the the complete information is for um, us to improve this program so that it's our participants are getting benefit out of it. Yeah. Now let's get into what exactly are we going to see today. Uh, by the way, you may have to focus on this this picture. By the way, so you're going to see a funny, funny incident to start with. Okay, um, machine learning at Amazon.com, the retail giant Amazon.com. So how exactly are they using machine learning? That's what you're going to see in this in this particular slide. Everyone, I'm pretty much sure most of us are customer of amazon.com. You might have bought some of the other products from amazon.com, right? right? The next time when you're going to join, log in to Amazon, based on your past history of your, if you bought a Python book, it's going to immediately tell you, based on your past purchase option, I would recommend you this book. Or if you would have bought something, exactly the similar kind of purchase option is what it's going to give you as a uh, recommendation system. That's the AI part which amazon.com is using on an inventory management side. Um, I don't know how many of you know about Kiva robots. So that's exactly what Amazon use in their inventory management. So, so whenever you um, order for um, CDs, whenever you order for some electronic goods, phone, whatever from Amazon, it's not like a customer representative is gonna to go to the warehouse and he's gonna pick all these things and come back. Right? That's what we assume, but that's not really what happened, right? Based on analytics, um, Amazon, this Kiva robot is intelligent robot, which has information of where exactly I need to place myself. It needs to go travel to multiple paths and it's going to give, find out a rack which meets with those customers order, right? Because multiple order might be coming up. It's going to go and pick it up that particular um, order which satisfy all those criteria is going to come near to this particular warehouse agent, right? So that's how they make millions and billions of customer request satisfied in a fraction of some, some minutes or in hours, they're able to do those fulfillment, right? So most of the warehouse centers have such kind of robots uh, since I was working with Amazon. So now Amazon cafeteria also has something similar to this, this Kiva kind. So, so cleaning, uh, all those things have been done, similar kind of a robot. So I don't know how much intelligence has been added to it, but yeah, so that's, that's what you're going to see uh, in, in future. Okay. Drone, everyone knows what exactly is the drone Mm, pretty much now even the pizza uh, delivery and most of the things are being done by drone. So Amazon was the first one to really innovate or uh, spend a humongous amount of money in this drone delivery thing. So now they promise a 30 seconds delivery, right? So that's exactly what the, sorry, 30, uh, 30 minutes, I believe. Or yeah, something of that sort. So that's, that's the kind of promise what Amazon want to keep with the prime customer, 30 minutes delivery kind of a mechanism. So that's where the drone comes in play for you. Alexa, um, most of you know about Alexa now. You give a voice instruction to this and it's going to respond you back, right? So there are, you can treat this as a small kid. You need to be careful about Alexa because, because Alexa is like you're keeping a small kid in the corner of your room. Whatever your conversation with your spouse, with your friend or whatever, it's slowly learning all those things and it's going to respond to it based on what exactly Alexa learns, right? So that's how you need to, it, it might be good or bad for you, right? So you have uh, a mystery um, alien sitting in the corner of your room and listening to all your conversations, right? So that's what exactly Alexa is. Now the final one, Amazon Go. Um, most of you might be knowing what exactly is a Go. So it's a 
So it's absolutely no queue. You just um, have your app inside your phone. You just walk inside a store, pick up your components, and you just, um, or maybe whatever is your grocery items, and you just walk out uh, without even standing in the line. Automatically, those billing and everything is done based on your app. That's exactly what Amazon Go is, right? So this is how the tech giant or or maybe a retail giant, Amazon.com, uses this inventory um, for inventory personalization and all those things. The technology has been used. Now, the beauty of what the sessions, what you're going to see over here is the technology that powers Amazon.com, right? That's exactly been uh, module or capsuled as a service. And that is what AWS is handing it over to you. So, so any big um, enterprise kind of a customer that has been using the technology, that exact same technology we, can be used by startups like any of the small, small startup, right? So when, when they're just starting their industry, they can have the power of those kind of machine learning and things like that. All those things, it's not going to be a CapEx kind of a model, but pay as you go. Whenever you need such kind of a system, pick it up, start using it, and when you don't need it, and, or if you think that's not the kind of solution that I need for my firm in the starting state, I just want to shut down it. Fraction of a cost is what is meant for your experimenting. And that's where the biggest success in the current era is, right? So don't, you don't have a fear on experimenting. That's something the cloud provider has brought in, in your mind, right? So that's what about amazon.com technology friend. Now, this is the slide which you might have seen in our last session. Okay, so how exactly an ML stack is categorized? Right? In AWS environment, when you come into AWS environment, your technology stack is categorized broadly into three different parts. First one, we'll start from bottom up approach. ML framework and infrastructure. Now, what exactly this means, this bottom layer? It's nothing but... Um, if you are a data scientist, right? So, so um, I'm not sure how many of you are in a full-fledged data scientist role over here who's attending the session. Um, okay, so I, I used to conduct sessions for uh, uh, McKinsey. Um, they are, they are um, those um, statisticians and data scientists. Before so-called data scientist role came in, those guys were doing completely in a statistician method, right? So that's what you call them. Um, I was delivering a session for them almost four years back. So how exactly they do um, the sophisticated complex algorithm is they every single guy in that company organization I don't know how if any one of you are attending the session from McKinsey so they have a, a pretty hefty laptop it's a huge huge humongous kind of a laptop that's what they carry it's 64 GB RAM and very very um, high in processing and all those things right 64 GB RAM is what their uh, laptop is why exactly because they won't run their compute application so clients will just give them some Excel-based data and they just bring it into a, a bit, and that's been given inside a pen drive. From the pen drive, they copy it, put it in their laptop, then they run this model. That model is going to run for maybe one or two hours, get those models created, and then they're going to hand it over to them. So that's how they used to have the process, right? That's not a big data solution yet, right? So they have maybe 2 GB of data, they have maybe maximum 10 GB of data. That's what they play around with, right? But today that's not the case. You may have petabytes of data before you create a model. You want to have a pinpoint accuracy much closer to 95 to 99 percentage, right? In the traditional world, it was close to 70 percentage or 80 percentage was considered to be the best model that's been created. But now you need 90 to 95 percentage of accuracy and that's where you need humongous amount of data. Now, Running all these things in a laptop, that's not going to work. You may end up spending almost months running this process. Right? Now, how do I, or what is the solution for me in that case? That's where the last layer comes in place for you, which is nothing but ML frameworks and infrastructure. You're getting into cloud environment. You're getting GPU-based machines, massive big P2-based machine, P3-based machines, which is having 128 GB RAM. It's a processing CUDA core processor, humongous amount of bigger, bigger machines. Now, there have been organizations who combine these machines and make a supercomputer out of it, right? So supercomputer is invisibility of every, even a startup now. That's the ground reality. That's what we are talking about over here. You can have a, a bigger, massive machine created for yourself 
the when, whenever you need it, uh, P3-based machine or um, F, uh, FPGA machines, and you can use all the available frameworks as, as well over there. Like TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, whatever framework that's available in the market, you can use it for this particular infrastructure, right? So that's the first part. Now, and what you're going to do in this infrastructure, you're going to run your model. Um, now you want to have a little bit of more managed service. I mean, this is all raw system, a, a, a machine given to you, right? I'm giving you a powerful machine and telling you do whatever you want. You're going to say, no, I don't have uh, much of visibility of how to do a patching for the machine. I'm not a networking guy. I don't have much visibility on how exactly security needs to be managed. I need your help over here. Can you do something? Cloud provider came back and say, okay, I'm ready to help you out and over here. So in case if you, if you are someone who does not know or you don't have a resource available for who can do an infrastructure management for you, I'm giving you ML services. And that ML service is nothing but SageMaker, right? The SageMaker, the session which we covered last time. So it's nothing but for your building, your training, your deploying, everything, I'm going to give you a, an off-build product, right? You're just going to take your machine models, training, testing, everything is done by SageMaker for you. That's the next layer, right? Now we are going to come one level up. I'm going to say, I'm least bothered about training, uh, testing and everything. My industry has just data. Would you be able to help me out coming up with some sort of a personalization or things like that? I'm, I'm really not a data scientist. I have limited knowledge on data science. I'm maybe, maybe one percentage or maybe five percentage knowledge. I have, I know that if you provide supply some data, you can give me recommendation predictions and all those things. That's the bare minimal information that I have about data science. Would you be able to help me out in that case? That's where Amazon come up with, or an AWS come up with something known as AI services. You have multiple services, recognition, text track, poly, transcribe, translate, lex forecast. You're not going to cover every of this thing because each and every of this session itself may be one or two hour session, right? So what you're trying to do over here is now pick up some of these services and just scratching on the surface, right? At, at least I'll tell you how exactly you can see those services in an AWS console and how exa exactly you can play around with that, right? So, so what we'll do is um, recognition surveys, we'll, we'll slightly deep dive using console. Also, how exactly using a Python program, I can do a recognition service. That's, that's what you're planning to do. But remaining all services, uh, considering the time uh, period what we have, we will be just seeing through console, right? So that's, that's what we're going to see. Okay. I will just pause over here time being just to give a logical break and any questions before we actually are going to deep dive, which is the major component of this session. We're going to deep dive into these. Any questions over here till now? Anything? Are we all in sync with the agenda? Are we? Yeah, you, it, this is the right time for you to give me feedback. Okay. I mean, you can tell me. I really appreciate. I mean, kind of know someone telling that the voice was not clear. If, if I'm fast, give me a feedback. Okay. I need to be slow down. I, I get at times excited about some of our services, right? some of the AWS services, because some loyalty attached to AWS. Right? Um, so do tell me, I mean, in case if I'm pace is um, a little high, voice is high, voice is low, whatever. Right? So this, so that after two hours, yeah, there is some benefit. It cannot be a complete full-fledged knowledge completely that I will be able to hand it over, but at least where to start, the pointer can be definitely I mean, that's, that's the whole and sole idea behind the session. All right, some of you give me a feedback telling that, okay, it's, it's good. Uh, we are in sync. All right, so being that said, let's move on. Okay, uh, if I use too much of technology terms, it might be slightly boring. So let's, let's start building a story over here now, right? The story is, let me pick up, um, uh, I, I'll just pick up one of the person who just recently, Money Vanan, I can shorten your name to Money. Is that is that fair enough, Money? Right. So Money is one of our character now. Right? All right. Um, the scenario or the scene is um, there has been a prisoner who escaped from the jail uh, today morning six a.m. Right. Anyway, six a.m. That, that's morning time. Sorry. Yeah, six a.m. A prisoner did a jailbreak and he ran away from the jail. Now, a police inspector 
uh, is coming up, approaching maybe great, great learnings. I'm not sure why that, that's slightly off for the story, but still. Now we are going to make money as a detective over here, right? So a police inspector come by, approach money, telling that, okay, there has been a jailbreak exactly at six in the morning today. And I have photograph of this particular person who is the prisoner, right? And now we know that this person would not have left Bangalore. So I'm, I'm, I'm residing in Bangalore. So let's make it as Bangalore as our location. And what happens is I have just taken most of the CCTV clippings of around that area, six to nine. And we have information from our intelligent agency that post nine, this person has been idle somewhere. He's not making a movement. So we want to make sure that person is caught uh, before uh, 6 p.m. or something so that he'll start again uh, running away somewhere, right? So we wanted to, your help, so basically money is the detective agency now. It's a sophisticated tech savvy detective over here now, right? So police is approaching money and say, can you really help us in, in figuring out this particular thief, right? So what police is handing over? Just one picture of the prisoner and then there are a huge amount of CCTV uh, picture that has been given to him, right? Let's hope the hope the story is clear. Right? This is nowhere um, uh, a different story than most of us would have seen, right? So you would have seen um, many of those Amitabh Bachchan movie and um, Shashi Kapoor movie and all, where there might be a jail jailbreaking happens, and immediately after the jailbreak, they'll immediately go to some function, and and the biggest fun, the, the funniest part of it is that exact same guy needs to be the performer on that stage, right? I hope everyone is in sync with that part. The people who are from this 80s and 90s would have seen many of these kind of movies, right? I'm not sure why exactly, but yeah. So that's that's how it is. So let's let's bring in our story over here and get our prisoners, yeah, services, recognition. Yeah, so the reason behind me asking you guys to look into the picture first was, okay, that's, that's cool. That is our prisoner, right? Right? So this is the prisoner now, which the police hand over and say, this is the guy who ran away from the jail, okay? And I, I'm, I'm not able to collect so many pictures because that may be slightly beyond the scope over here. So what, what, what the next part is, the next picture that's been given by uh, the police agency to money would be a group picture. There's a function happening nearby. They're just handing over that picture to him. So let's, let's let this be the, the, that particular function, right? Now the requirement is for a naked eye to figure out whether that particular thief or the prisoner is there available in this particular uh, um, gathering. It, it may not be possible because he would have camouflaged himself. He would have made, a, he would have seen in those movies, just make a, make a, what is that, dot on a cheek will camouflage the person, right? So that's, that's how those movies are made. Now this is your task. Now how do I find out, right? There comes as our service, which is going to be recognition. Let's bring up recognition service for you. Right, I'm just going to log into AWS. Uh, now, what does AWS have to do? Console.aws.com. I'm just going to log into my service. The first service known as recognition. And what exactly it's going to do is what you're going to see. So I'm assuming everyone of you are pretty familiar with with AWS environment, AWS console. Uh, in case not, there's a different small videos available in some of our other sessions, which may make you pretty clear. So the moment I click on services, that's the entire, when I left Amazon, it was 184 services. So maybe it's almost two months. So it could have easily touched 200 services now, right? So these are those 200 services. Some of the thing which we are going to uh, see over here would be which grouped under machine learning. All right, so you can see over here, SageMaker, Comprehend, Deep Lens, blah, 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 so many of services. We are going to talk about recognition, right? So we have a use case in our hand right now, finding out the prisoner from that particular uh, gathering, if that prisoner is available there or not, right? Okay, now how do I do that? So when I, the moment I take up Amazon recognition, this service, it's going to ask you, there's a demo option, blah, blah, blah. This is how you do it. Now you can have object and scene detection. That's one part, image moderation, facial analysis, celebrity recognition, face comparison, text and image. All these options are available for you. So let's take up our first scenario, uh, face comparison. 
just going to go for phase comparison. So that's what we have. So now this is the service which money is going to do our detective for today, right? So upload. First and foremost, what I need is I need prisoner. I'm going to pick up prisoner's picture over here. Uh, I'm going to upload open. And the next one would be the gathering, right? So the function picture. So the group picture I'm going to put and open. So you can see the fraction of time it takes just to do an evaluation and finding out every single image over here, every single face over here and finding out is this prisoner available somewhere, camouflaging himself, made a different facial expression, facial looks and all those things. And can it identify this prisoner, right? So that was a task given to money. So that's, that's exactly what it is, right? So this is the similarity with the 92 percentage of accuracy. It's predicting the person over here is the same person you can see in this diagram. So that's, that's, that's me somewhere over here, right? So that's exactly what it says with this accuracy. The remaining all are not uh, detected or the face comparison does not match, right? So that could be one of those application requirement for you. Um, just for, before we move on, um, any questions over here now? There might be a lot of questions um, in terms of, or are we all good? Uh, the first use case scenario. Sorry to build up a story which may not be fighting challenge, but yeah. Uh -huh. So all, uh, doesn't it highlight that, okay, this is the person recognized? Because yeah. uh, you just, um, uh, through the mouse pointer, you just shown that, okay, this is the person. That's correct. Um, yeah. So. Uh, very good question. So right now, the, 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 the GUI version of it, pretty good question, by the way, yeah? because, because even a naked eye cannot figure out, I mean, if I just uh, zoom this picture, it might be tough for you guys to even figure out which exact guy is, right? So this is how the current looks, but this is how exactly the prisoner look, and, and it was able to detect it. Now, good question. So now what you're going to do is, you're going to go to the next level. So the question over here, is there a possibility where you can actually uh, map it and get it, right? So how do I do that? Uh, yeah, Mani, you, it, it's pretty accurate, right? So this this is what the, I mean, it's, it's actually, this is the effect of you having a designer as your partner, right? I mean, uh, one of my uh, engagement partner is a designer. So I asked him to get a designer. So I was expecting him to just give me a, a picture where, I will be having a mustache and just this thing. So he made it, let it be more dramatic. He made me a, literally a prisoner and handed over to it. Right, so I didn't have much time to uh, make a change. Yeah, it's absolutely accurate. It's 92 percentage of accuracy. It's determined it, right? Uh, just to hand over the question. By the way, who asked this question? Um, yeah, myself, Devesh here. Devesh, okay. All right, so we are going to get into a programming mode of it and answer the Devesh question, right? So other way of looking into it is if I just scroll down, which may not make much of a sense for you guys right now. So this, yeah. So if I expand this response over here and I'm going to scroll up. So basically it's nothing but you are sending some requests to this um, recognition system, face comparison system, and it's going to give you some response back in a programmatic way. This is what you need to play around with. So where you're going to see that is, it'll give you complete coordinate, right? So these are the boxes which it's going to come up with. So till now, the GUI version of it is not going to box and give it, but that might be a next version which Amazon might be coming up with, uh, with the recognition. I mean, because this has been an ask, even when I was doing some of the session and there have been a n number of feedbacks that's been given. Uh, but this is exactly the boxing part of it. And it says, uh, I have found the face match um, method as called with 92.89 accuracy with which it figured out. And the boxing is like, you can see over here, left 55 percentage and uh, height, it's going to be like, uh, sorry, not height, uh, left and top is what you need to see. Left 55 percentage, top is 36 percentage and you have to use your programming in stuff and then have a circle created. That's how you currently do it, right? Now, what exactly that means is if I pick up that uh, picture separately, group pick, 
And if I calculate this particular, whatever you're seeing over here, 55 percentage from left. So if I take the 55 percentage from left, this might be my 50 percentage and this is my 55 percentage, right? And now next one is 36 percentage from top. This is exactly the diagram and 36 percentage. And this is where it end up. Now it's telling a width of two percentage. Uh, sorry, I'm getting someone. Some of you are unmute, I believe. Yeah, echo is coming up. Yeah. So next one is two percentage, and the height is showing it as uh, close to four percentage, I believe. Uh, it should be somewhere four percentage, and that's how it does the boxing, right? This is how exactly it creates the box. Right now. Recognition GUI mode is not giving you a box, but programmatically you may have to just extract it. And you have a number of function that can be called, which can just strip this exact same coordinates and hand it over to you. That's how exactly it works right now. We're going to see that part in a programmatically. That's what we're going to do. Just for recognition, we'll use an API call and I'll show you how exactly you can make an API call. But remaining services, we are going to see through only GUI mode, right? because uh, considering the time what we have. Fair enough. Does that answer the answer the question? Yes, it does. Yeah. All right. And uh, images can be in any format. Here. Uh, right now, it supports JPEG, uh, PNG. Uh, what else format do we have? Uh, not not many format because that's what. So I'm not sure about past two months. Was there any change? Because the reason behind me telling is, AWS environment. Even if you're an expert, what's really going to happen is every single uh, week they come up with a new new releases so they try to improve based on customer um, comments um, so you never know whether they started supporting the remaining part also right so that's the reason for it but when i left uh, it was just two format for supporting okay so we're just going to close this and i'm going to go back uh, first let's see through the slide once see the recognition part yeah so extract rich metadata from visual content Object scene, facial analysis, face comparison, facial recognition, and celebrity recognition. Right. So let's let's play around with the GUI part first, and then uh, move on to the programmatic way. Okay. Is there a quality check for the image, like not blur or something like that? Um, no. There is no much of a quality check, but that data is what you're going to get from here. You can see how much confidence it is based on this data. You can see. Yes, it's it's how perfect that image is. Right, so you may have to uh, call, make this method call, and figure out is that a shaky image or was was he able to do a prediction? All those methods and functions are available over here, and this is nothing but a response um, that's been sent back, given back by a, a face uh, call, a face compare app or something like that, which I'm going to show you in a short while. Okay, the next which one I the image what George, you, sorry to interrupt i mean one question yeah sure uh, say for example there is a scenario where you know there are twins you no know, okay. more or less the two identical people yes if that is identified i mean then what kind of percentage it would return and how that would uh, react to you know, so uh, if the uh, twins is identical twins it's exactly the same matching it's going to pick up and say both these matches exactly as a 95 percentage or 92 percentage yes it it does uh, same matching for both these uh, images. Oh, okay. That's okay. how it's going to do. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Okay. So the next part is object and scene detection, right? So you might have seen Google car and all those, uh, the car detection, how exactly it's been done. So it needs to figure out in an image, whatever the image is given, is there a car? Is there a human? Is there a skateboard? And this is a confidence interval. You can see over here the confidence interval with which it's doing this prediction. Uh, let me just show you that part as well. So let's upload one of our image and um, yeah, it, it uh, so next question from someone was how f different is it from Microsoft face API? Um, so, so every single cloud provider is trying to eat up in this particular area, right? But this is machine learning on the cloud platform is going to be the next trillion dollar business. So every single player is trying to make their product, make their service as accurate as possible. And that's the, that's the, battleground happening right now, right? So Google is trying with their own innovation. Um, Amazon is on their track and uh, even um, Microsoft in on their own way. So, so one algorithm being made better, the next one is trying to improvise on it. So at the end of it, customer is going to definitely get benefited with that. So that, that's all I would be able to say. 
right? So it's, it's almost same, but I have not played around much with the Microsoft Face API, but I hear from customer, it's, it's almost the similar kind of functionality that we have. So some of the features may differ here and there, but at a high level, that's going to be, that's going to be the same. Okay, let's, let's pick up this rec hyphen pick. Um, that's the image which we want to just predict. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's an animal, mam I mean, animal, mammal, um, horse. I I'm not sure what exactly when you call horse and stallion and all those things. Uh, anything about 95% or 90% uh, 90 of prediction, that's exactly what you wanted to pick up for your application uh, level. So if you're going to write this thing in your application, you're going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much confident that this is a horse and, and I'm going to use an application. So some of the application where you can see this is you don't need to have you can create your own collection ID and uh, for your organization, basically. You don't need to swipe your badge uh, to a door. Instead, what you can do is recognize your face and automatically it's gonna open. So, so I was there with Accenture almost five years back. So we had a similar kind of project that was in running. So it took almost three months uh, with around 40 FT working on it, right? So, so the, our requirement was um, when there was a, the face has been recognized, it's going to say, hello, Shaji, and then, then the door is open for you. I mean, that's the kind of uh, um, application that we want to build in. Now, using this sort of technology, it may take you hardly two to three days to create exact similar kind of application, right? So you don't need to swipe your card. So that application was basically, uh, in case an intruder is found in your premises, it's going to immediately tag that particular face and it's going to show it in the security, um, security manager's uh, mobile phone. Right, it's going to say, I see an intruder over here. Would you want to accept or reject this particular intruder? Right. So the moment the security guy is going to say reject, it's going to buzz an alarm, and then you may have to um, some security is going to come and escort you, and then take a, another ID and things like that. So that's that's how uh, those applications can be built in. Right. Also, some of the uh, good use case for this would be uh, how to pamper those uh, customers. Very, very wealthy, right? So you're going to get privileged when you walk into that. So that's that's the kind of application that is being built for some of the uh, domains right now. Okay, you can pick up Amitabh Bachchan or anyone, so it's going to immediately recognize all those images, um, famous personalities. Everything is going to get detected. You can use facial text and image. This might be another use case where you might be pretty much looking for. So anything in this particular image has been picked up and shown over here. You can see over here. Um, this might be a, a very good use case in today's right. Uh, the toll booth, whenever the card number is being flashed, immediately you can pick it up and you can see over here, C, J389 and NLT, all those things are being captured over here. All right, so this, these are the kind of use cases uh, where you can use um, recognition service. Okay, let me just real quick show you how to use this in programmatically as well. Let me just open up Atom. Okay, detect uh, face, detect, Okay, so what you're trying to do, the one thing what I have done through the GUI option, so you as an automation guy, you as a programmer, you, you may not be using our money as our detective. He, he may not be interested in logging every time and then he wanted to have an automated system in place where he's just going to feed it. Okay, the moment he gave him the picture, what he may have to do is take up the entire bulk of picture that a police officer is going to hand over, put it in the S3 bucket, right? And you may even build a web-based application over here for, for you. For, I mean, if you are being tied up with Bangalore um, police or something of that sort, you can just tell them, upload your entire image. And that image is going to go and sit inside S3 bucket and the prisoner you want to do it. So that's, that's how this program is going to receive your images and they can, they can do it on their own, right? So one phase dot PNG. I have just made some changes to all these things. So I want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. One phase. I have it over here and group pick. Uh, yeah. All right. So I think it's, it's we are in sync. Now what you're trying to do over here is exactly the same thing. Uh, programmatically, how exactly you can do it. The beauty of it is see the amount of complexity involved over here. One single call API call, which is compare underscore face. All these things are very, very clearly documented. Every single program, what I'm picking up over here is from an Amazon documentation, which is like um, crystal clear documentation available for you. I just picked up, copy pasted it. Absolutely not even a single change apart from these two things, right? I've not made any changes. I'll show you that 
documentation level also. There are a huge number of such kind of programs available for you. So what you're trying to do over here is compare faces, call this API, and similarity threshold. That means the confidence interval. How much confidence interval do you need? 90 percentage. The moment you have this confidence interval, it's going to give this response, um, the data back to the response, right? And then I'm going to give this coordinates. Remember the left top with blah, 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 all these coordinates. So that's exactly what um, it's going to uh, result back for you. Um, let me just real quick check. There was some question somewhere. Uh, can I use any recognition service for a specific use cases? For example, identifying cracks of a concrete using the picture of a concrete. Um, uh, recognition service for specify. Okay, so this sort of real application, what you may have to do, uh, you may not be able to. A simple reason is because we don't uh, the, the think of there is a crack and there is a face standing next to it, right? So your application would not be able to understand what exactly am I am I meaning. So you have to train your application. So that's where we might be using SageMaker or any of this application, right? So you may not be able to understand unless and until you're training it and telling them, I'm interested in that crack because it has not seen a crack before it. And so you may have to do that training part before any of these services being used. Okay, so let me just run this module for you. And I, my assumption is you guys know uh, how I can execute this program uh, because, I mean, this is a Python program basically, but how does a program that has been residing in my laptop, which is under this location, it's, it's in um, under um, tech, under GL over here, accessing a face service and executing it. It's nothing but I have done an AWS configure and configured my user ID and password over here. In fact, access key and secret, um, key ID and secret access key. I'm assuming everyone knows it or in case no, there is some sort of a, a knowledge gap that you need to bridge up, right? So that's nothing but AWS configure. That's what, uh, okay, let me just real quick show you rather than talking too much, right? Um, I'm just gonna do a control command plus plus change this color to show inspector does everything is black right so let's make it as maybe blue okay i'm just going to make plus 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 like his great learnings color is more blue and white as all right okay um simple thing aws configure not just going to deep dive into completely but i'm just just telling you when i do this AWS CLI installation inside my laptop, provided my user ID, password, AP South one. Uh, how did it go back to AP South one? Okay, um, that's good that I figured it out. Okay, so so now my, my, my issue over here is AP South one is nothing but Mumbai, right? Will it work in Mumbai is something which I need to figure out. So this might be some issues which you also might be facing. Now I'm gonna click on this and I'm going to figure out, yes, I do have a recognition service available in Mumbai, right? I uh, hope you guys know that whatever is being highlighted over here, the gray colored one, I don't have that particular service available in Canada, um, Osaka, uh, Hong Kong. I mean, this is nothing but Tokyo's, uh, Pal uh, Paris, Stockholm, none of these places have this service, but it's there in Mumbai. So hopefully it should work for me. <laughs> So otherwise, I'm just going to change my region coming over here and then do that in case that doesn't work. Um, so CD tech isn't, okay, so I think it should be in CD documents. Tech, great learning, no, LS minus LRT. Um, I think it's in R&D. Uh, no, I goofed it up somewhere. Um, I think it should be inside my code and then Present working directory. I am inside tech R and D. Oh, sorry. All right. Um, and I should be going inside LS minus LRT, which is CD codes. I think I goofed it up. That's not where I expect to come. All right. I may have to go back, see, do this all over again. Um, I might have to first figure out the location. I'm sorry for that. Um, it's inside tech and inside codes and GL, right? Code and recognition and GL, all right. That's where I goofed it up. Okay, um, 
So CD documents and uh, tech CD code recognition. Yeah, there you go. Um, that's uh, detect label dot Python or phase detect. So this was supposed to be phase detect. Um, so I'm just going to run this Python and phase. Um, hope it works. Fingers crossed. Uh, yep, there you go. So that's that's exactly the same result which you got from your previous previous call, right? So it's giving me. Uh, so the only reason which I did is just to make you guys clear on what is being re um, responded back by the system. So what I did over here is I just made the the response face matches to face match, and I have just displayed what exactly I have just printed what is the face match. So these are the components available in face match out of which I'm going to pick up only this, um, only, only, only this part, right? The face bounding width is going to be two height and left and right. So these are the only component I'm picking up and I'm showing it over here, right? So in your programmatically, what you're going to do is I'm going to pick up this and have this coordinates available, take up some of this function and then then extract that particular image or something of that sort. So that's what I would be, I would be doing. It, or just put a pointer on exact same location. So if I have all those coordinates available, I can have a marking being done, right? So use a marker application and then just doing a boxing. So I, I'm not sure that there might be, I mean, um, I guess uh, um, Devesh has asked this question. So there might be a application that is available, built and available where you can create a box as well, but I have not played around much with that. So, so that's, that's how exactly you run it through a programmatic way. Any questions before we move on to our next service? Okay, um, I got another question. So if you want to train a deep learning model for a specific use case, can I do it using SageMaker? Absolutely, yes. That's what SageMaker is going to, going to do for you. Or SageMaker only for machine learning services. No, so SageMaker is so SageMaker is exactly like whatever training testing model, what you want to create, that's SageMaker for you. Only thing is what SageMaker is giving you is the entire platform. You don't need to worry about building up a platform. Right? As, as we discussed the last time, um, for a training purpose, uh, okay, just, just a very, very brief overview on SageMaker. So SageMaker is nothing but, uh, so today think of you are a data scientist, you want to write some program, uh, you want to write some model. What you do? You open up maybe Anaconda or something on your laptop and write your modules and compile it and then set it up somewhere. It's all a messy environment. SageMaker, the moment you log into SageMaker, a Jupyter Notebook environment is given to you, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to just log into that Jupyter Notebook environment. You start writing your code. And then in that code, there might be a, a call for your training module, right? So the moment you make that call, what's going to happen is immediately a bigger machine is going to come for you. And then in that bigger, that bigger machine might be a GPU-based machine, right? So the beauty of it is for writing your code, you have an M4X large, a small machine, a CPU based machine, right? But when the training comes, automatically a bigger gigantic machine is gonna come for you, which is a GPU based machine. And you're gonna do the training in that particular big machine, right? And the moment you complete your training, automatically that big machine is gonna get die by itself and your model is gonna get stored in an S3 bucket. I mean, it's, it's a very, very high level. So that last time what we covered in two hours is what I'm trying to get in five minutes, right? So, so, so that's exactly what SageMaker is, right? So it's a platform service. So whatever, so, so you can come up with your own machine learning algorithm, but currently AWS is providing you almost 17 different sort of algorithm. That was two months back. Maybe it would have increased, maybe close to 20, right? The 20 different algorithms are provided to you and you can start using that, right? So framework, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, everything is available for you. Keras, um, MXNet, everything. So it's exact same environment, but it's very, very easy for you to use. That's all. That's all you need to. And the beauty of it is hyperparameter tuning beyond beyond uh, this session. But yeah, so all those things you can do. Okay. So being that said, uh, we are just going to move on from it because otherwise we may end up spending too much of time over here. Um, any questions, by the way, before we move? To the next part, but yeah. So the reason behind I'm stressing some point over here is this is the key part of it, right? So the so how exactly programmatically you can do is all what you need to know, all right? Um, 
So I have another program also available, which is nothing but, um, I think that's a phased detect label, right? So let me, let's me let just run this guy as well. Um, for running this, I may end up having some problem because SPK SageMaker rec, where is this reside? Okay, so next, remember we have actually detected a horse image Exactly the same thing. How can I do with programmatically? You can see one single line code. That's all you need over here. This call makes you detect underscore labels, right? And that's going to detect you what exactly uh, programmatic way, right? So client equal to borrow three dot client recognition that makes the client, uh, you're calling up a recognition service. And then inside, you're going to have detect underscore label being called which is going to detect. So basically what we may have to do is SPK SageMaker check. So what we're trying to do over here is that horse image I have just placed inside an S3 bucket, right? And then I'm running the recognition uh, from there, right? So first and foremost thing, what I want to find out is where is my, this S3 bucket residing based on that I may have to, and okay, that is one point that you need to remember. Wherever your S3 bucket, um, you should be calling this service from exactly the same region. You cannot do a cross region call. Oh, sorry, uh, that was that was a little step away from my end. I just need to call the S3 service. Yeah, but you can shoot questions in between us. Huh? So I'm just trying to show one more programmatically so that you understand. I mean, that's, that's the key part of it. So I just want to find out where exactly this particular, um, let me minimize this. Oh, it's in Mumbai. Cool. Oh, that, that makes our job easy. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's superb. Um, I have record pick. Okay. Okay. Then it's fine. Everything is cool. All right. So any questions over here kind of recognize from a database. I mean, it goes and search from criminal records. Um, TD Sahu has a question. Can it recognize from a database? It go and search from criminal records. Uh, Database, it can actually do, but but how do you make it? Uh, so it's all your application module, right? Um, okay, okay. Before making the statement, uh, I, um, I'm sorry, I may not have a picture perfect answer for it. As I say again, I'm going back to a two month story. We either have to have it in your um, folder on your on prem on your laptop or something or S3 bucket. But very recently I happened to see some article from Amazon or AWS, which says it can start detecting from, um, I think one of the databases they have just mentioned. Uh, so you have to just look into the documentation from whether it started recognizing, but, but almost two to three months back, no, it can only pick it up from S3 bucket. But the reason behind S3 bucket would be the much safer ground and much easier so it's, it's very, very easy, right? So in, in an application module, uh, whenever you're going to develop, you can take your JPEG file, just bombard it in your S3 bucket and you have, your job is done. But now if you want to do an indexing for this particular S3 bucket object, DynamoDB table is the best thing for you to do it. So that way you can do it. But an image where it needs to be placed, I would definitely say that needs to be an S3 bucket. I mean, if, you, if your application needs. All right, is that, is that fine? Okay. Uh, here, Amazon have already trained, so the program knows its horse. Uh, how we, how do we do it ourselves? Uh, uh, so basically, what is that you need to train? Uh, so in that case, that's where. So in so, humongous amount of images are being picked. So it's going to be close to millions and millions of images are being, or maybe even it's in billions of images are being trained, and that's how exactly these applications are being created. So now, if you want to train it on your own. Then as I, I mean, I guess uh, one of the GL guys have asked this question, the crack being found out from a concrete, that's a very good uh, use case. You have to train it. That's where SageMaker is going to come to you as a savior. So you may not be able to do an AL service, uh, sorry, AI service. You may have to go for an ML service, which is going to be your SageMaker and, and start using it. You may have to train your model basically. So if it's going to be an entirely a new image uh, of an alien whom you got it from somewhere and if you want to train it, Yes, you have to do that training on your own, which is SageMaker. Um, yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, that may be a question for uh, some of the GL folks that's attending over here. Uh, so I don't know how exactly this videos have been shared. 
Um, so you may get some response from that. Um, maybe I'm not sure Ekta or someone is attending the session. Yeah. So Ekta, uh, there's a question for you. Uh, will it be possible to share a SageMaker video? Yeah, that's 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 a question. Okay, let's let's do do this real quick. Uh, to, 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 to. Right. So what we want to do is ls minus lrt. My program is what is it called? It's called detect label. Detect label. There you go. Yeah. So everyone understood the scenario. I'm assuming uh, SageMaker. This is my bucket. I just need to replace the bucket or whatever. So as I said, this program is just a copy paste from the AWS documentation. Absolutely not even a single line change. The only line change is my my bucket name I have provided over here. So as and when these things have been shared. I'll even provide those information to um, one of the program managers so that they can give you where exactly the documentation you would be able to find and things like that. So that makes your job easy. All right. Um, okay. The phase detect group um, Python um, and sorry, I'm slightly out of place. Detect label, detect label and py. Right. So this is how. Oh, there you go. So exactly the same thing. What we got from that detected so it's going to say mammal blah 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 and you can utilize exactly the same thing programmatically that's that's what we will be doing it so this is one way of doing it um, so because in the console base is not how you automate your system right so you may have humongous amount of picture whatever comes up with about 80 percentage sorry 90 percentage of accuracy or 95 percentage of accuracy that's what you need to pick it up okay real quick i want to show you one more thing Remember uh, over here, the accuracy with which it predicted the prisoner. So this was our prisoner, right? Okay, no, this was our normal. It was not a prisoner. So it, it gave us some other. So now what I want to do is um, an image. Okay, let's run this once again and then see the prediction accuracy. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the previous one. Phase detect. I think we did not do it for the phase. In fact, what I may want to do is I want to pick that prisoner's image over here. So in my program, I'm just going to change it to instead of one phase, I'm just going to change it to control V dot JPEG. I'm changing this module, change this program and running it again. Um, that's phase detect, right? Uh, enter. And now it should give me a different accuracy because the previous one was 96 or something. Now it should be 92, right? So that, that shows that this is our previous, the previous run that we have, would have given, would have given you a, a 96.4 accuracy, right? So that was a different image, uh, which I had. So that was the image that was, that was predicting, right? So now we have a prisoner image, which is predicted with 96. Now, what I want to just show you is, so since it's 92, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this prediction accuracy to 95, right? So 95. So now what exactly that means is whichever image matches with the prediction accuracy of, of confidence interval of above 95, only give me that result. Otherwise don't give me anything, right? So that is exactly what you're trying to say over here. Fair enough. So I'm just going to do that. Run it, change it. Now what's going to happen? Because it gave us 92 percentage, and my expectation is anything above 95, it's going back and came back with nothing. It's going to say there is not even a single image which have above 95 percentage of accuracy, right? So, so that's that's exactly what I wanted to just show you guys. Hope that's clear. Any questions? Let me just change it so that after some time I may not even remember what I did. All right. Um. Any questions over here or are we good to move on? Um, so that's all we need in terms of those two services. So now going forward, we, I'm not going to show you how exactly it's programmatically run. Just go to the documentation. So basically, where do we see all this documentation? Just blog. There are enough number of use case and blog given for you of which you can use it exactly the same way and start um, training your models and, and play around with it and things like that. So that's that's the beauty of this product. Right, so we're done with recognition. Um, I wanna just show you what exactly is Comprehend. Uh, before moving on to Comprehend, any questions? Or are we all good to, you find service too easy to understand? Or is it too tough to digest? I think it's pretty straightforward and simple, right? 
Uh, no, uh, good question, Mani. Uh, no, you have um, a, a huge number of languages being supported. Uh, you can have Java, Python, .NET, Ruby, all those things are there available. And with the code, it's available on this documentation. But, but I am a Java illiterate, so I understand a very core Java. And Python is what I'm much comfortable with. So that's the reason my, my complete example is on Python. That's all. But if you are a, a Java guru or, or many other languages, let's go to, to comprehend now. Um, what really is comprehend? Um, um, it's nothing but a sentiment analysis, right? So, so I was just trying to search for uh, our uh, iPhone uh, launch sentiment of guys, iPhone 11, but I, I was not able to figure out, I, I was not able to get a lot of uh, thing which talks about Chandrayaan, Chandrayaan 2. Let's see what is the sentiments. Is there a tweet available? Okay. So what exactly is compliment? Compre sorry, compliment and comprehend. Oh, how do I bring this? I'm I'm facing a lot of issue. Okay, yeah, got it. With the zoom tab, it just plays around. Okay. Fine. So um so let's see what exactly this talks about. Now what 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 comprehend is going to do is when you want to develop an application. Okay, yeah, I see an Ekta response. I think that is for money. Yeah. Amazon Comprehend Medical to, 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 to launch Amazon Comprehend. So I'm just going to click on Amazon Comprehend. See over here your customers' um, um, sentiments. I'm just going to feed in that sentiments. It's going to give you what is this customer talking about. Let's, let's talk about a real time scenario. Just like iPhone, um, iPhone 11 got launched. Right. So what exactly how you can develop an application? Think of now your company came up with a product which might be uh, a new phone. So what is it phone? OK, think of now iPhone 11 only. Now you're going to go to Twitter and find out what is the customer sentiments about it? How does the customer feel about your product? So previously, remember, whenever one plus uh, one plus created a launch, um, I'm not sure how many of you remember some four or five years back, one plus did not give a massive launch. What they did is to get the platform, one plus one was launched or two or whatever it was called. It was launched. Um, they have just launched around 10,000 product. And then, and that too with invitation or something like that with invitation. Why do, why do the custom, why do the product makers does such kind of strategy? What they're going to do is find out the sentiment of the people. What, what is the customer talks about it? Right? How, how are they comfortable with it? Are they happy about it? Are they sad about this product? In case there's a huge amount of customer going to say it's an amazing product, they would set a threshold for themselves, telling that 80 percentage of customer, if they're going to talk about good about this product, that means my product is being really appreciated in the market. Right? I can launch it; it's going to be a huge success. So that's exactly the strategy many of the many of the product builders are going to use. Right? It's exactly the similar kind of thing. Now, what you want to do is you launch this product, a new product. Only 10,000 products have been launched in the market. Now you are going to take up the tweet information and push it inside this particular comprehend, right? And what you're going to do is you're going to just do an analyze, right? The moment you do an analyze, what is going to happen is, so sentiments, I, I'm just not even reading this. Uh, it, it's a high probability of this going to be a neutral, right? So Vikram Lander didn't crash into pieces. Orbiter finds it on the single piece of blood. It's pretty much... Pretty much a, a very very straightforward neutral statement. Um, let's let's make it as iPhone or um, iPhone 11 is one of one of the most amazing product ever. Um, great features. Okay, let's make it as great uh, F-E-T-U-R-E, right? So you always uh, um, uh, find a lot of, so this is how you find your tweet, right? It's, it may not be spelling correct and all those things. So you, you great features and um, great functionality, functionality, blah, 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 right? So yeah, even, even that spelling mistake is fine. And I want to do an analysis on this particular. So basically it's a tweet from someone and a huge amount of tweet can be picked up over here and then you want to do an analysis, right? So it's going to tell you, uh, so, so it's, it's picked up entity 
iPhone is an entity, one quantity has been picked up, which is not correct. Which, uh, we made it as iPhone 11 is one of the most, but it made it as a quantity, which is a wrong prediction. Um, it's still an evolving product. It's not still, still doing a machine learning sentiment. Let's look at the sentiment. What is it all about, right? It says this statement, what someone has given is 99 percentage positive. Where is it? Yeah, positive 99 percentage, right? So think of you have launched this product. You are the product manager for, uh, for iPhone 11. Now you are going to take up the sentiments and see around out of 100 people who are treated for this product, 80 of them are telling it's an amazing product, right? You get your confidence in, you're going to say, now make a million product and start launching it in the, into the market. Our product is going to be one of the most successful one, right? So that's the kind of confidence you as a product manager is going to get. Now, um, on another hand, if it's right, it's going to say it's one of the worst product, worst product, it really have um, bad performance, performance, uh, and things like that. And then let's do an analyze on this. And, and I'm coming to, okay, I mean, in case we are not able to see that complete screen one shot. Yeah, so this is the box where you're gonna provide your uh, information, right? And you have tabs available. Entity, entity is nothing but it's gonna pick up all these things as entity. You have key phrases. That's gonna be with what confidence interval. I'm gonna say it's an iPhone 11, it's gonna be, uh, I made this statement and my confidence interval for that is 99 plus, right? So all those things. But the key, key portion over here that you might be interested would be what is the sentiment of a customer, right? And he's gonna say it is 99 percentage negative, right? So in case if you have launched a product, iPhone 11, and you have launched only 10,000 product, it's better you're gonna to go to a product manager and say, please stop your product because the product which you launch, 80% or 90% of the guys are talking bad about the product. It's not going to be a, a hit in the market. We may end up losing our money. So let's stop it, stop our productions, make some changes. Let's see what is this customer talking about. Is there any recommendation that they're suggesting and get it in as a new feature added into this product and then let's launch. Maybe we may have to have the uh, full-fledged launch date to another date. So that's the kind of confidence you as a product manager uh, is going to be um, getting in that case, right? Whatever I shown is through GUI mode, exact same thing. You can have it through, um, um, through the programmatically, an automated way, just like the way I have shown you. It's a pro Python program, uh, Java program, or any of those program. Any questions before I want to show you a real use case, which is available in Amazon documentation. Okay, so that's somewhere over here. Uh, working with images. I have just collected some of these links. Uh, build a social media dashboard, blah, blah, blah. Click on this. This is a real application that you can build, right? So I have done almost half of it, um, but I, I never knew this, this product is there. So I have done my own innovation and my own programming, but then I came to know there is such kind of a blog available. So this is what you can do. Right, this is typically a use case for your comprehend purpose. Twitter data, your product that can be your product information. Uh, your product, so basically, what you're going to do iPhone 11, the hashtag that particular product information is completely going to go into something known as Kinesis Firehose. Right, I am assuming you guys know what is Kinesis Firehose. In case not, let me just give you a, a brief of it now. Think of iPhone 11 tweet is coming like 1,000 tweets per second, right? Across the globe, guys are tweeting, right? 1,000 tweets per second. That's the amount of fraction you're getting, right? Now, what Kinesis Firehouse is going to do is you can directly capture all those tweets, right? It's, it's tweets coming one after another, and you can say bundle those all tweet in a minute fashion. Right, so that means in a minute, you're gonna get 60,000 tweets, right? You get accumulated with 60,000 tweets and you have made a file out of it and you're gonna just push that file inside an S3 bucket. Is that clear? So that's what Kinesis Firehouse is. The streaming data is gonna capture your streaming data 
It's going to convert that into a file and that file will be pushed inside Amazon S3 bucket. Not even a single line of code you need to write over here. But yeah, here you may have to write. Here is just like a connection. You're just going to have a connection string pushed. You're just going to mention in Kinesis Firehouse this S3 bucket name. Automatically, it's going to push it over here. In sync till here. The moment you push that file inside an S3 bucket, because that's going to be in every single minute, so there is a trigger option available inside S3. All right, what's going to do is it's going to immediately trigger a Lambda function. It's nothing but a Lambda service, a serverless compute function available in AWS. I'm assuming you guys have a little bit of knowledge on Lambda. Um, else you may have to, I'm not sure which program completely covers the Lambda part, uh, which is very, very, very important for you guys, Lambda. It's, if you are going to be in an automation environment, that's going to be a life savior. Right? So, the moment a file has been pushed into S3, immediately at that cap, data will be captured by a Lambda function. Now here you have tweet, right? So Lambda inside Lambda, you might have written a program. That program may look, look like, uh, that program may look like, yeah, that program may look like something like this. And even this is exactly a program which is available inside a documentation. I picked up just exact same way, right? So this will be a program which is actually picking up data from your Twitter. I mean, no, that's not the program. So this is after you get it inside your S3 bucket, right? After you get inside your S3 bucket, this is the Lambda function, right? Handler Lambda, and it's going to just read that. You can see over here, where is it calling your sentiment object, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, there you go. Detect sentiment, right? So this is one line API call deep inside dot detect so deep inside is nothing but the the one which you called over here right so you can see over here or is that an api call that you're making yeah whatever right so from here uh dot detect sentiment and that sentiment is going to be, get reflected over here it's going to say it's a positive one negative neutral or mixed right and then what it's doing is it's actually converting that and this is exactly the same program i'm talking about yeah it is going to convert that into a CSV file and that file will be sitting over here. Now, Athena, which is a serverless SQL query engine, you can connect this to the CSV file, start querying it. You can select, uh, select star where uh, positive greater than, um, uh, the total number of positive greater than 80 or something. So you can get a list of entire guys who has written about positive, which location are they from? and things like that. So that is what you're going to query over here. Get into QuickSight. You can visualize it. QuickSight is nothing but just like your Tableau, right? And you can get your end-to-end -end service. And this is entire blog available over here. With So you can step-by-step -step do this and you can get this solution created, right? Entire solution can be created over here. Um, so this is the blog. Maybe I'll, I'll send it across to the program team so that you can get the link or you can just search for just make a search in AWS. Uh, this would be your search. Or, okay, what I can do is I can just take it up. So that's going to help you out in coming up with this end-to-end, -end, this entire application. Um, I know for a fact there are, there are a huge number of guys taking up this solution. And I think minimum four or five customer they got from US and they have asked for my consultancy for it. This, this exact same thing, right? So don't think it as a small one. So if you can even create a, uh, a prototype, a POC of it, you can start making up your own product and you can, you can sell it in the market, right? So that's, that's how demand, how demanding this entire ecosystem you can create. I mean, I mean, I, I know, I mean, I may not be able to reveal a lot of info, insight from that, but Many of those blogs available as a real-time blog, which you can actually implement in, in some of the customer location. And you may get a, a pretty much huge project, right? So it's pretty um, interesting one use case, this one. And you can um, get this thing in any of those industry, you can telecom industry, healthcare, blah, blah, blah. I like comprehend this available even in the healthcare industry, by the way, right? Okay, any questions? before that, or, or are we all in sync with how, how exactly that can be used to comprehend? And you can use this link as well so that you can practice or try to create it on your own, your own end.
Okay, considering the time, uh, I am assuming the silence means we are good. I'm just looking for, yeah, next service. Um, okay, so this is what, what I was talking about. You have Comprehend Medical as well available, uh, which is, click on it. So you might be seeing such kind of, um, this is the, the medical transcription being done and this is how your, your data is being prepared, right? Out of which, once it's done, there's a huge fight happening between, uh, or maybe not really a fight, the, every cloud provider wanted to get into this medical field, right? So there's going to be a huge, huge industry going forward, machine learning and, and the medical industry, right? So, so this particular data is being pushed inside a real-time analysis, and you can see the kind of analytics that came up, came out of it. So it's going to say that person is of 40 years of age, is an high school teacher, he or she is a high school teacher, uh, the symptom is right sleeping trouble, uh, blah blah blah. I don't understand rash face, all those things, and you can even come up with what what kind of uh, prescribe. I mean, I don't think they are in a stage where there will be a legal consequences when you dis prescribe some of the medicine, but it's it can be given to the medical practitioners and switch off a button. They say, okay, these are the these are the prescribed medicine in the past. Do you want to pick up any of those? I mean, that's how exactly the industry is going to go, right? So 10 years down the line, you definitely don't know what exactly our doctor is going to do. Switch off a button is what the only task, right? So that's that's where you can see some of this product. And I, I'm, I'm pretty much sure you guys would have seen AI for healthcare. The Google has come up with the retina, retina scanning one, right? So so that's that's the kind of industry all these cloud providers are trying to focus because that's another trillion dollar business okay all right so moving on um, i'm assuming no question or any questions as you guys did not respond i'm assuming no questions uh transcribe did you talk about transcribe comprehend is what we spoke about uh, you have huge number of other services like translate translate is nothing but i'm going to pick up a span i mean you might have seen that translate don't want to get that it's exactly like your google translator right so you're going to take a spanish language it's going to convert to an English language and hand it over to you. That's that's exactly what it is. Uh, it can be done. Um, so transcribe poly is nothing but whatever you write over there. It's just going to read it out for you. Now, what is the use case for poly? Uh, a typical use case, which I was thinking uh, on my own ground. Um, everyone know about. Um, I'm not sure whether you guys can listen to this if I play. Uh, so it's it's just going to read it out for yourself. I don't think uh, because I'm I'm on my speakerphone, so I mean, sorry, hand headphone. So it just reads out this exactly. But the beauty of okay, let me just remove three and then just show you. Tick 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 tick. Oh, you can hear. Oh, that was okay. All right. Okay. Hi, my name is Joanna. I will read any text you type here. Right. So beauty of this product is. Um, it may not be more robotic, it's, it can be more made more uh, human friendly kind of a voice. So, uh, so you can see over here, uh, listen to this once again. Hi, my name is Joanna. I will read any text you type here. All right. Now what I'm going to do is, it just say, I will read any text. It's a plain statement it's making. Now what I want to do is I'm just going to put a comma over here and see how exactly it's going to do a stretch on, I mean, the, the pause on that I will. Hi, my name is Joanna. I will read any text you type here. Yeah, so, so you can have your own le lexicon. You can customize your pronunciation and all those things can be done over here. That's the beauty of it. So now you have even Ravina coming up. <laughs> Where is Ravina? All right. So. Hi, my name is Joanna. I will read any text you type here. Um. So, so it doesn't matter in case if it's going to be, um, you can even have a standard engine language and region, uh, Hindi, you can, you can give even a Hindi word over here. It's going to read it exactly the way it is. So if you do a Google translator and get a Hindi word, um, uh, and it's going to read exactly the same for you. So multilingual, um, all those things are available for you. Just let's do that. Google. So you can try it out, but, but I'm not sure. Um, how are you? 
So yeah, that's that's the beauty of even the Google translation it's doing. Um, uh, are you going to attend the class tomorrow? Acha, <laughs> yeah, it's just me now. Uh, whatever, but let's see. Yeah, so that's where control V. So it can even recognize that. Aap kaise hain? Kya aap class tomorrow mein bhag lene ja rahe hain? So that's that's the beauty of it, right? So it, it gives you more a human feeling uh, on those applications that you develop. So a simple application which I was thinking about, um, I'm just revealing my thought process. So you might have, everyone would be knowing about one shot, right? So think of one shot kind of an application and you're driving your car from, from, your, uh, from your home to your workplace. And what you want to do is I want to have that crisp 20 seconds of uh, complete news available for me, right? So if you develop an app of that sort, if you, I mean, I don't think one shot gives an API for their existing platform, but in case if there is, there is something which is providing such kind of an API call for their existing language, I'm just going to feed in that to my poly immediately I can get those 20 seconds flash news after news. And one interesting things about one shot is it's, it's customized one, right? So it's going to tell you only of your interest, right? So I have, I would have picked up um, sports as my interest. I would have picked up um, international news as my interest. Only those relevant information is being passed on. So similar kind of application can be easily built using Perly. Um, and you can, you can market your product and that's, that's all, right? So that's, that's some of those, uh, where you can utilize uh, some of these existing services, right? Okay, moving forward. Um, okay, I guess I guess remaining all is pretty straightforward. I'm just going to talk about rather than showing it because it's as simple as that. Lex is nothing but um, Amazon Alexa is being powered by Lex. So basically, it was other way around. Basically, what happened is after the success of Alexa. AWS team started isolating that technology or powered um, Alexa to a service known as Lex, and then they started uh, giving it to the entire customer. That's how exactly it is. Recognition, transcribe, <coughs> translate. So, <coughs> sorry, um, I just want to text extract. Text extract, let me just show you through uh, what exactly is text extract. So, text extract is nothing but it might be an OCR. That's how even Amazon calls it. Let me just show you text track through your, <coughs> through our slides. <coughs> and then uh, the final one will be personalized. Um, and then we'll wind up our session over here. Um, text track, you can see over here, OCR++ service to easily extract text and data documents. So what used to happen in a data extraction process is like this, right? Dealing with the document is demanding. How can we make it easy? So this is a PDF documentation. And your OCR or your traditional um, reader used to do this job, right? You can see over here, every single thing is treated as one single line. And look at the haphazard or, or a very shabby way with which um, the scanning of uh, data is being given to you or your data extraction is given to you, right? Now, is there a better way of doing it? So now you want to develop a machine or you want to develop a system in place or an application in place which can recognize this is a separate table altogether. Separate it out. Give me, give me the results of it. And these are something different. Give me a separate text of it. Does our application have so much of intelligence? And that's exactly what OCR, that's what AWS claim. But it's, it's I wouldn't say, I mean, yeah, I, I don't need to be a marketing guy for AWS, right? So it's, it's almost there, but there is, I would say, a lot more, I think I realized that I've just, uh, so it's it's almost there, but it's not 95% uh, of factory. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. Because I'll just show you a simple example of, I'll just take up my pan card and scan it and show you how exactly it looks so that you, you actually are convinced in real time how much accurate it is, right? So Amazon's claims, this is exactly how it looks like. So this is the product. Uh, so this is the form, application form. Now, one of the biggest challenge for us over here now is there are huge, huge number of applications. You can see a government organization, enormous amount of data has been written, application forms are being filled. How do I digitize it, right? That's, that's, that's where we want to get into. This is the kind of tool that's gonna help you out doing. So it's name, 
It's been picked up by Expressly. You can see over here, every single thing is run uh, over here and it's, it's, it's giving you the data, right? So that's, that's what the kind of um, accuracy text tract is planning to give it to you. Right, just let me see. Yeah, that's exactly. Translate is nothing but the translate. So let me just show you now that service real quick so that you understand what translate, uh, sorry, um, text tract, right? Text tract, yeah, there you go, that's text tract. Yeah, try Amazon text tract. That's, that's the exact claim. So this is the documentation available for you. And that's how exactly you are, you are employment application and all those things and programmatically. So every single thing that I'm showing you from the console have a corresponding API call and programmatically you can access it. So you get all this parameter, then you have to you know, use your regex function and blah, 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 and then try to get this extracted, right? So I'm just trying to get my PAN card scanned over here. Upload document, I have my PAN card. Yeah, there you go. Um, open, right? So the moment I do that, that's exactly what the information that has been spacked up. So it's, it's going to say, I'm, this is my name. It's going to be father's name, date of birth, blah, blah, blah. All those things are getting immediately tracked. So that's, that's the beauty of this product. Right? It, it's just on a fraction of seconds, you can just get. So if you have any of those um, documentation and all those things, use an API call, get this extracted, and you can get your area, use it in your application. Right? So that's high level tanks, uh, text track. So before going to personalize, any questions over here now? Because personalize is something, any questions or are we all good? Um, translate, transcribe, personalize, forecast, text track, rephrasal. Okay, transcribe. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Let me just give you a quick information about transcribe as well. Uh, rest of everything we covered, forecast, forecast we don't plan to. Yeah, transcribe is nothing but, uh, let me just open up even that. Uh, no question from you guys. My assumption is you're unsync. Please raise your hands in case if you think chatbot doesn't come under ML. Um, no, uh, even I have not played around much with chatbot. Uh, do, do I have a chatbot as a service over here? Do I have chatbot? AWS chatbot, yeah, you have, okay. RoboMaker, yeah. Um, none of those services I have because even I have not explored chatbot, sorry for that. Yeah, chatbot doesn't come under the machine learning one. By the way, I don't know where exactly that fits. Yeah, I remember, you're right, chatbot was their option, which is in, yeah, even you may not be able to play around with it because it's in the beta version, you may have to have, um, you may not have access to the service right now since it's in beta, you may have to have a separate <clears throat> permission request and all those things to get it done. Okay, but good that you said, I can explore that. Um, now, what were we talking about? We were talking about do, 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 transcribe, right? So transcribe is nothing but, think of now you are having a call um, with a customer care. You are having a call with an Airtel customer care guy now, right? Um, now, you remember our, uh, Comprehend solution, right? First and foremost, when do you call one to one number, right? You are definitely, you have so much of free time. Let me just talk to this one to one because of their excellent service. And let me just make everyone happy. That's the last thing you might be doing, right? One to one, the moment you make a call, that means you're not happy with the service. That's first and foremost. 80% of scenario, it's been cut short over there itself. Now, next one, only 20% you need to see based on the tone, based on the language that you're going to use, right? How do I figure out, how can I separate the communication or the conversation between a, an agent, as a call center agent and a customer, right? So that's exactly what Amazon Transcribe is gonna do for you. Uh, let me just do this real time, um, not the real time one. Real time one is nothing but if I start streaming, uh, whatever uh, uh, allow, whatever I'm gonna talk, uh, it's gonna just come appear over here on the screen. All right, okay, I mean, yeah, so that's, that's how exactly uh, transcribe work. And then what you, can, what you can do is you can just pick up this particular um, text and then go to push it inside, comprehend and find out whether what is the sentiment and blah, 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 right? So that's exactly what this tool is. 
the beauty of this tool uh, let me just stop this guy he might be annoyed with me now stop streaming Right, how, how well it has captured every single uh, statement that I've been made. All right, so now what exactly this tool is going to do is, now you might be hearing a conversation um, before you talk to a customer service guy, right? Your conversation um, will be recorded for training and quality purpose, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's some statutory uh, voice that you might be getting. Now, what are they going to do with this voice, right? How well are they going to utilize? I used to have that in my mind, right? They might be getting millions of such kind of recordings and how how really are they actually analyzing each and every of this call right my only intention now is pick up all those call where there is negative sentiments to the core right how do i figure it out this service what exactly transcribe is going to do is um let me just show that okay so what i want to do is the conversation happened with yourself and your customer service agent. That will be an MP3 file, right? That MP3 file will be loaded into an S3 bucket and you're going to give a path over here, right? And you're going to say it's MP3, blah, 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 all those things. Now what you can do is um, it is going to, so if you want to have an accuracy improved, a simple thing, what you need to do is speaker identification, click on this. And you just tell them how many number of people are speaking are there in this conversation. I'm going to say only two. That means me and that customer agent, right? What it's going to do is the, the conversation that is coming up from the left hand side of the speaker, it's going to detect that the agent is the one who is speaking it, right? And just like in the, in, in, in the conversation, you can see, right? Agent colon, agent, whatever he, uh, he or she spoke about customer cust colon whatever the customer spoke about so that how that's how it's going to differentiate it right now in your program you can just forget about what is the agent's agent's communication you can just pick up only those conversation that is done by the customer right put it up into make it an array of of statement or whatever and then now you can just push this information inside uh your uh, what is the service comprehend right in inside your comprehend service and then you can figure out whether this customer is a happy customer or it's an unhappy customer. If it's going to show it as negative and positive value, um, you can just, and, and if the confidence interval is too high, that means this customer is very, very unhappy with you. There is a high chance of he is going to churn from service from Airtel to a Vodafone or, or Geo or whatever, right? So that's how you can find out the customer sentiments and take some corrective measures so that you can get back your customer, right? So, so market uh, analogy says to retain a customer, it's much, much cheaper rather than getting a new customer, right? So you may have to spend a humongous amount of money. So every possible uh, new um, um, complimentary additional service being provided and all those things can be strategized based on this kind of um, uh, services that's available for you. Okay, so that's, the, that's what your tran transcribe is doing. Um, okay, I guess we are, we are running short of time now. A uh, real quick, um, uh, what's our last service? Any question, by the way? Uh, two things, what, uh, so one, I'll just give you information. What exactly is forecast? Forecast is nothing but, um, you provide a humongous amount of a time series data to this forecast application. Okay, um, so, so past uh, two years data, you're going to supply to forecast. Now forecast is going to come and say, um, it's going to give you multiple options. We don't have enough time for coming up with all those options. So it's going to tell, I'm done with my learning. Based on your data, it's going to automatically tell you, okay, based on the data that you supplied, I think the best algorithm that needs to be used over here is uh, deep neural network or hierarchical uh, recurrent neural network. Right. Oh, sorry. Recur um, recurrent neural network only. Uh, RR. Yeah. Recurrent neural network. I think in Yeah. HRNN. That's that's Amazon um, home home grown grown algorithm basically. Right. So that's the best one for you to based on the scenario what you've given me based on the data set that you've given me. Right. It's going to automatically do that model building and solution providing and all those things. And it's going to ask you when it's doing this task. It's going to ask you. How long what do you want to forecast? Now you can say, I want to forecast for the next one month, next 35 days, uh, or next one day, or based on the use case that you have, right? What exactly this, this uh, service is going to do for you is, 
think of now you are, um, what is the scenario over here? Um, maybe the, the, the temperature is much be the, I mean, I, I, was, I was trying to create up some of those real time, temperature is the best guy for you. So past two years, temperature is there available for you. I mean, that, that's the every single guide. So there are some, some documentation, pretty good use case of a forecast, but I, I'm, it's, it's kindly going out of my mind, right? So temperature wise, past two years temperature, I'm going to say next 36, 36 hours, what's going to be predicted forecast? A temperature um, for, for a Saturday or Sunday. I'm just going to mention it. Immediately, it's going to give me a forecast at um, the graph. It's going to say um, morning uh, one o'clock, early morning one, that's going to be the temperature. Two, this is going to be the temperature and it's going to give you an exact same map of it and the forecasting one. But for doing that end-to-end -end forecasting, the, the, the tool that is going to take you almost sales forecast. Absolutely, sales sales forecast would be the pretty pretty good one. Uh, it may take you almost like four to five hours. This end to end process of this one, right? So that's that's something which you need to have in your mind because your data might be humongous. That data needs to be supplied to this tool, and it's it's just like installing your Windows machine. I'm sorry, in, uh, Windows machine, right? Click next, 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 next. It's going to give you the solution, right? If you choose automatic way of doing it, it's going to select your own algorithm. Uh, so Amazon is going to select its own algorithm, but it's going to even allow you because you are in better control of your data. You are a data scientist. In that case, you can say, no, I don't think Amazon's prediction of um, HRNN is the, is the um, great product because I understand my data well. I'm going to say um, uh, gradient, I mean, the XG boost is going to give me a better result. I know that because I've been playing around. I'm a data scientist in my end. You can pick up those, uh, which is available inside the option for you and you can start running it, right? So that option is also available for you, right? Uh, that's forecast. Um, similar wise, let's do personalize. Now personalize, uh, sorry, I'm going to go a little fast. Any questions you can shoot before this personalize comes up. Now this is the story over here now. So um, I'm assuming some of you are already in the data science environment. You have done the session of data science uh, from Great Lakes or from whatever means. Uh, but there might be some core developer also who is attending this session, right? Who has not done a data science session. Now your interest is, okay, I'm a developer. I don't understand much of an algorithm or how to. So based on, so a simple thing, if I see a linear chart, so a, a, a a growth, sales growth, and if it's showing me a linear growth, I understand it's a linear regression. Right? It's as simple as that. Right? So I need to apply some linear, uh, whatever is the corresponding uh, linear regression uh, problem. Now, if it's going to be a binary, binary issue, whether the sales is going to happen, the customer is going to buy this product or not, then that's going to be a logistic regression for you. So you as a data scientist or a pseudo data scientist understand this kind of an issue. Now, if you are, if you are data graph is showing you a parabola. Now you understand it's a second polynomial degree kind of an issue for you. You have to use uh, some other algorithm for that, right? So that's something which you know because you are uh, a mini data scientist. But now the scenario is, now you are a developer. You, have, you are a guru in J um, um, Java, you're a guru in Python and all those things, but you're absolute one percentage in all of knowledge about data science. You have no idea of what algorithm to be applied in what scenario. That's exactly when personalized comes in um, as a savior for you, right? So how exactly personalized work? This also is going to take almost four hours for end-to-end -end process to happen, but I have already already processed and kept for you, uh, which is in which environment? Yeah, I think it's, it's done in somewhere in Ohio. Uh, so let's take Oregon and then show this, and then we'll move back to Ohio. Okay, so I've changed the region to Oregon. And that's my personalized service, personalized. So I'm assuming everyone got what the, what the, the key guy, how exactly this guy is gonna help you, right? So I'm just gonna get started without wasting much of time, get started. Now, first and foremost, uh, for a personalized service, what you need to provide is, uh, there is a very, very good documentation available from AWS itself. I mean, that, that's what I use for my learning, okay? Uh, I will even provide that information for you folks so that 
uh, they detect sentiment for customer review for comprehend. I think, I think that's the one, right? Yeah, that's 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 a documentation available for you. you. Can play around with this. Control V. Yeah, so that's where it it completely describe what needs to be done and blah blah blah. Right. Uh, so now the scenario over here is building an application just like Amazon, Amazon.com. It's exact same. So you you can you can watch some of the um, videos available from um, Amazon reInvent event where using this service, which we are talking about now, they have actually built exact same recommendation system as Amazon, right? So that means if you are a Flipkart, now think of now Flipkart does not have a data scientist, not a real time scenario, I'm, I'm trying to cook up, right? Now Flipkart um, is not having that much of venture capital money or whatever, I mean, th there is no much of an investment. Now what they want to do is, um, they can't employ a data scientist, uh, humongous amount of money they need to spend. Instead, what they want to do is, they have a humongous amount of brilliant uh, developers over there. Can I use any service from any of the cloud provider and take this recommendation system, right? And that's exactly what it is. So wh whoever buys a product from, from Flipkart, now what they want to do is, what would this guy be interested buying from me next so that I can recommend this product from it? So some of the analytics says, Netflix, 82% of the Netflix sales happen through recommendation, right? And personalization is, is the next big thing or, or currently the big thing, right? So most of the activities or an item that has been bought by a customer, there's a huge influence on you recommending to that customer, right? As a human being or as a, uh, as a customer my, myself, I wanted a little bit of pampering, right? So if someone says, why don't you have a look at it? Right? That, that's exactly the case. I think of now you're, you're trying out a new, new dress and if you write in, go right in front of your mirror, um, you may not be able to have your own opinion. But, but if someone, or the sales girl or sales guy comes and says, oh, it looks amazing on you, sir. I mean, that's, that's exactly what the product, you, you don't have a second thought about it. You immediately are going to pick it up and start walking over it. That's exactly what personalized or recommendation does, right? A service is going to boost your kind of um, sales with this kind of uh, small trigger in the market. That's exactly what this guy is going to do. What it's going to tell you is create a data set group, right? What it means is provide your data. I mean, in, in a simple line, okay, let me just come over here. This data set group is nothing but you have passed two years of uh, sales data available with you, right? What it means is you have to provide information like what are the customer ID or user ID and what particular item that user has bought, right? So that interaction between a customer and an item that he bought needs to be provided over here, right? How does it look like? Um, yeah, I'm just gonna show you a sample so that you guys understand what exactly I'm talking about. And this service, personalized service, is expecting your data to be provided to it exactly in this format. User underscore ID, item underscore ID. Right. So personalized service, the, the scenario over here is you are going to do a recommendation system. So based on your data that has been provided, your algorithm is also going to get changed, which has been provided by a personalized, right? So user ID, you're going to supply item ID. And this is known as an interaction, um, um, inter interaction, yeah, uh, interaction between the user ID and item. So think of now scenario is, uh, let's talk about an example. This is like a books. User ID one has bought book number one, or maybe movie, movie number, it's a Netflix. Net, so think of your providing solution for Netflix. So user ID one is me. I have seen a movie, which is item ID one, which might be Terminator now, which may be some other movie, um, Jurassic Park one, two, and three. And all these movie item are given over here, right? So similar wise, if I go down for a user ID, that's one. Uh, if I go for user ID two, that's my user ID two. User ID two has watched all these movies, right? These are the movie that has been watched. It is not a really a movie buff. So in two years, he has watched a limited number of movies. Number three, he has watched also less number of movies. Four, hope you got what I'm trying to say, right? So that's how the data set I'm providing to personalize, right? Based on this information, I'm just gonna write it as test. Test info, uh, next, uh, test data set group, not info. 
um, or let's make it as GL uh, data set group. And this is where you're going to provide your data set, the one which I showed you, right? I'm going to say this is my data, uh, GL data, GL data, and, and the schema, right? So you can see over here, it's exact same schema I'm providing over here, right? And then I'm going to GL data, create a new schema. I'm going to say this is my GL schema. And I'm just going to go next. Here is what I just need to provide my job name because that needs to have a job running behind the scene for you. Data set import job. And you have to provide a role as well, right? So all these things, the documentation which I provided to you, step-by-step -step instructions are there for you. And this is the S3 bucket where you have your this file. You can see over here, this file, this interaction file, you're going to supply it over here and then finish. The moment you click on finish, it's going to take you close to one hour before it, it just create that model and give it to you, right? Let me just show you that exactly the same thing which I have already run in Ohio. No, that's not my data set group that's created. That's not an active one. <clears throat> uh, it can't be in Singapore. Is that in Oregon itself? Oh yeah, there you go. That was in Oregon itself. DL design, no. That's something which we created just now. Okay, one other issue with this product is Oh, I think my existing solution is completely stopped. Okay, so, okay, just let me just give you a very, very straightforward. So, so what we are trying to do over here is the first part, right? So you just need to provide import and provide it over here. The moment you do that, you end up creating a solution, right? You create a solution over here. So once this process completes, that means your data set got imported. It's going to take you one hour almost to churn it and figure out how exactly your data set looks like. And it's going to do your model solutioning. And that's where it's going to, it's going to start. Once you click on the start, so this, this recognize the data set of yours. And now it's going to provide your machine learning solution on top of it. It's going to create a model based on it. And then it's going to come up, try come up with your solution, right? So that's the process that's going to happen over here. You're, you're training your model with the data set that you provided. That's what gonna happen over here. This is gonna take another one hour by the time this entire process happens. And once you're done with that, you just need to launch a campaign. So the next option for you is launching a campaign. Now launching a campaign option, what they're gonna do is, they're gonna provide you with a sample data. Now what sample data which you want to do is, is an existing, um, you can see over here, um, these are the customers that have, that have seen, watched the movies and blah, blah, blah. So over there, you will be provided with a space where it's gonna say, which customer ID are you interested in providing a solutioning? Or which user ID? I'm just gonna say a user ID, maybe 600, right? So that is a huge, it's a humongous amount of data. So I'm gonna say user ID 600, which is available over here, that customer has watched all these movies, By 99 looks like a pretty big movie buff. Um, yeah, so this customer has seen all these movies. Now provide a recommendation for this customer. So many, this algorithm will make sure that none of these existing movie will be again shown it back to that particular customer. And based on the hierarchical neural network or deep neural network or whatever algorithm that has been embedded inside, it's going to do the prediction for you. Right, so that's how exactly it's going to the final campaign. You can just do that. And this exact same thing can be used in your application, right? So you can use, make it as an API call. And the moment you have your customer logged in, right? So think of example, the customer is going to be 600. Now enter a login ID, that login ID would be 600. So the moment that 600 logs in, immediately whatever the recommendation that came from this campaign, that will be listed out and they'll be showed to a, um, thrown to a customer. So you don't need a data scientist. You don't need any of those sophisticated guys to come up with those solutions. You can just use the personalized service and it's gonna help you. One last chance. I mean, I'm not sure why exactly that has been pulled out of my environment. I think, I think the given data set group does not exist. Amazon personalized. 
yeah it it pulled out of my environment it was residing over here yeah it's it's showing get started that means my entire solution there could be some reason some correction in the environment or something uh which pulled out uh the entire ecosystem from my end i mean that's what so basically i've done the complete solution and kept it ready um uh, in the morning in fact because i don't know whether it's um price wise is it going to create um there will be an endpoint that's going to get created but hmm, could be that could be one reason why it just pulled out yeah yeah so maybe maybe i think i think the lessons learned is i may have to just do this exercise maybe one hour before the session so that it doesn't get pulled out otherwise your entire cycle is pulled any questions by the way um so so don't worry about in case if you don't if you're not able to visualize it completely the documentation that i sent is exactly what i did um almost in the morning so that i i don't because i know that it's going to take almost uh three or four hours the end-to-end -end process that's the reason i did it in the morning and kept it All right so that's that's what you may end up doing um throw your questions now that's really what we had in terms of the session um let me know what is the take i mean how could we improve this program or was it beneficial enough you spending your time with us for 2 hours your feedback would be really appreciated how well you understood how what I is the sorry. point then yeah sorry to disturb like, no problem i wanted to know how would you integrate one function to another function Uh, what do i mean by one service to another one service you meant to say one service yeah. to another service yeah so it's 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 not direct call or anything it's as good as you are making an api call over here right so you are going to take that particular result in a temporary buffer or something and then you're going to call a next api call it's just your programming skills that's that's exactly what you do so basically think of now this response is nothing but an array for you you're going to store that in your temporary buffer or something and then you're going to call using that particular function you're going to make another call which is your face underscore detection or something as simple as that uh, just your programming only through uh, cli that you can do that or uh, from the gui also you can do that no not through the gui uh, so so the gui if you do you can do it basically what you will be doing is um so just like money we made our detective as money right? so basically he will pick up that particular photo out of those 500 photos he picked up one selective photo and then he he will have to give it to a next application so you can do it through ga but that's not what you may want to do it in your real time environment right you might be a person who might be interested in deploying this kind of solution to your end customer so you may want to do it more but if it's going to be a learning purpose yes definitely you can do it so a simple example would be uh, translate for example now translate you're going to translate a spanish language to english right and take that particular language that you translated and then give it to uh, uh, comprehend that means that is going to give you a sentiment analysis that exact same what you're talking about is there as another another application uh, it's there uh, those informations are available as a, a blog right so what what they're trying to do is a spanish language uh, will be picked up by a translate and that is being injected by um, a lambda function into a uh comprehend um and it's going to do uh, sentiment analysis analysis over there right so so that you can just do plainly using the console doing it console is very i mean it it's a it's a like a like if you have your fifth standard uh, child he or she can do it it's as simple as that it's as yeah you can do that but uh, the beauty of it would be how exactly you can integrate it through programmatically using an api call so this has came up in the sentiment response take up this response put in the next application do this churning blah 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 and then move on keep keep doing this right so that and even that is very very simple all these programs whatever i'm showing you every single thing is available in aws documentation some of this documentation so you can see over here if you just traverse through uh, making a, a prior call to it you should be able to see that documentation yeah thanks no problem sir uh, can i uh, abhijit has a question can i use nlp base on my requirement say i don't want sentiment analysis but something else for my use case yes uh, in um, so you are you are talking about 
<coughs> you want to have a custom built application yes you can do that also yeah i didn't i didn't go to that extent uh, in fact comprehend one one of the available application for you i'm not sure abjit when i'm getting your questions right huh? uh please correct me if if it's not the case launch comprehend you can even use comprehend for uh, custom classification right now what you can do is train your classifier you can see over here so it's just scratching on surface or slightly not so you, what so you have a new feeling that's anger right you wanted to find out whether how many of the customers are angry so what it says is you must provide minimum 50 documents to each classification category and you're going to say angry 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 and in each of the csv file that you're going to provide give this text <clears throat> sorry it's going to recognize okay this means it's it's angry so that kind of customization you can do now you're going to say no i want to use a complete different nlp uh, algorithm itself can you do that definitely you can do that that's where you're going to use sage maker or any of those services and you can utilize it uh, for your purpose should your questions feel free for another couple of more minutes in case you have any um I, we would really appreciate if you guys could um just give your feedback so so what can be improved in this program or what's good in this program you can even say something this is good this is good this is bad this is bad right and we can do a sentiment analysis negative positive and and then so whether this program was successful or not right so that i mean it's it's, it's very simple as that uh, we can just uh, improve on the next time when we do it so it's it's It's, it's just a mutual benefit. What do you find good in the program? What what is that you think or recommend as an improvement for this program, so that in the future sessions that we conduct, uh, we have those things incorporated. That's why finally you do sentiment analysis, right? Yeah. Yes, uh, Rahul, is this only uh, is this the only session? Um, I'm not sure. Yes, yeah, that that's a response from Ekta. in the session so yes um yeah so we cover a little bit of iot um yeah but but my my hands on and dirtying my hands because of i have my own raspberry pi been set up but but, but it never worked all right so i'm i'm struggling with that but but there's a you know how exactly aws environment is is altogether 200 different services so i couldn't focus on so iot once upon a time was my was my passion but that passion slowly died it overtook with machine learning and deep learning to be frank yeah but it's a, it's a very good area to explore uh, i would say because there is an iot service available in aws you can integrate seamlessly with um uh with an existing solution of us and uh, yeah yeah kinesis and all yeah yes absolutely um that that's a good area to explore because because you might be seeing a lot of connected devices coming up and and things like that uh currently aws provide close to 17 different algorithms so just just search for um aws algorithm oh so that's for sage maker i'm talking about aws do support every single um framework and this thing available below the sky i mean that's that's exactly what it is but now if you want to use it in the sage maker there are currently 17 the story is two months back i would say 20 plus maybe close to now right because it's two months they would have reached a lot more so 20 plus different algorithms is been currently supported by sage maker um uh and um yeah so so if you want to use it in some of these existing services there might be some four or five so amazon is trying to um uh, project or or use so for example now amazon is may not be a huge fan of tensorflow Uh, because the customer is a huge fan of tensorflow that's why they have incorporated a lot of features and functionality in sage maker but amazon similar kind of product is mxnet so mxnet might be uh, because you have an affinity towards your own baby that's that's a different story altogether right than your neighbors maybe slightly more you might be slightly more biased that's exactly what mxnet is and that's exactly what um, hierarchical uh, recurrent neural network is hrnn is another amazon home ground product so they're trying to promote they're trying to get the best uh, best maximum benefit out of it so that's 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 exactly what it is okay yeah that being said i guess if there is no more question thanks thanks for your feedback folks uh, really appreciate your time being such a nice participants less number of questions yeah So this brings us to the end of this session. Let us quickly recap the pointers that we touched upon. 
So we started this session by understanding machine learning services with AWS and artificial intelligence services with AWS. We explored Amazon SageMaker and Amazon recognition. Then we went ahead and understood how image detection, image processing, object detection and phase detection works with AWS. And we also touched upon other ML and AI services. I would also like to inform you that Great Learning has come up with Great Learning Academy initiative where there are 80 plus free courses to which you can register and avail certification on completion. So that's it from our end. We hope you had a great learning time and going ahead too you have great learning experiences with great learning. Thank you.